Hello everyone, welcome to the stream. Nice to see you here. As always, I'm late, but that is why we have these Chris minutes and not real minutes because it's always more than <laughs> like <laughs> it's always more than a real minute. But whatever. Um yeah, nice to see some people here already in chat and uh, looking forward to talk a bit about the Lord of the Rings universe and Tolkien's uh, law and so on and already see some awesome uh, questions here. And Aris Aurelian has already put in some several good questions in chat. We might uh, go through uh, in a moment. I hope you people are all doing well and had a fantastic day. Also, um, Stefan says um, that uh, that he likes my videos. I appreciate that quite a lot. Much appreciate, uh, appreciate it. Um, thank you. So um, welcome here as well. Nice that you catch here a live stream of mine. I hope sound is good because it's always a worry and something um, I initially not always realize when it's not good. But maybe I can listen to myself for a moment. It, it seems good. Okay, okay. It seems from on my side it sounds good. Hope if you have any issues, if it needs to be louder or so, let me know. There's definitely something we might be able to do against that. Also, Homebody is here. Welcome. Guten Abend to you as well. Sound is fine. Okay. That's, uh, <laughs> sound is fine. We have to find the sound. Yeah, but uh, and much appreciate. Thank you for the uh, quick feedback, uh, feedback here. Also, I have to <laughs> adjust my microphone here for a moment. But okay, that should um, work. Yeah, as always, um, when we start recently, I had like a very we had a very interesting video on this channel. I made a video, a video I thought it would be interesting, which was the um, asking ChatGPT, like a ch uh, AI chatbot, machine learning based chatbot, um, some law questions out of the Lord of the Rings universe, and um, that was very funny to do. I recorded like two hours and only published like half of it so far, so. Um, uh, kind of funny. We might see a follow-up video to that, but yeah, probably depends on the feedback. So if you haven't seen it, let me know um, what's going on there. Also, the brothers of Crin is here. Welcome. Nice to see you. Uh, I'm doing fine. Um, hope you are also uh, doing uh, well here, fellow content creators. So if you have not enough law video uh, or law information here yet, or other uh, on other channels, maybe check his channel as well. So I would say we could already start with like uh, the first few um, questions or if if there's a topic we um, could dive into, uh, let me know as well if, you, if there are any um, topic uh, suggestions that we might want to discuss. Feel free to do this. Usually sometimes like if no questions are there, I sometimes have a topic prepared, but usually people simply have enough questions to do this. Also, somebody just press the like button. Much appreciated for that. Uh, feel free to do that um, on this thing. It will be also available as a VOD, so you can watch it not live as well later when the stream is done. So a lot of good questions. We we come to this. I will start with Aris Aurelian because he asked his question quite a moment while ago. And um, of course, he's also channel member, so he has priority when it comes to questions. Just to promote a little bit this membership feature here on YouTube. But um, yeah, let's start with this. Maybe repost your questions. I try to keep up with uh, some questions posted here, but at times we might have to. Um, I don't want to scroll back like half an hour, so that's um, basically the problem. <laughs> Congrats being a member. <laughs> Congratulations. No, I much appreciate I appreciate the support a lot, but also people pressing the like button, stuff like that. Another one pressed the like button. Awesome. So um, let us continue. Uh, let us uh, answer the question here. He said also, um, I can bring it up on screen. I will be lurking a bit, but here are some questions. So was Huan a talking dog? I think the question with Huan or the thing with Huan is quite uh, kind of interesting in that regard because he was definitely able to talk it seems but um, he was kind of not allowed and he was only 
I think at this very end allowed to talk, something like that, right? I have to admit the Huan story or the part where he appears is quite blurry currently in my mind because I have not read it in quite some time. As you have seen on this channel, I recently did the, um, the misconceptions about the Rings of Power video. And uh, that, of course, is like topic-wise quite different from, from this particular question. So let me bring this here up on screen. So was Huan a talking dog? So there were multiple entities from, let me just see. Also, I have a bad feeling. Yeah, something is wrong with my screen here. Now it should be fixed. Um, let me just see, where do we have our map here? Just we have some visualization. So several entities are kind of associated with Orome the Valar of, um, of of hunting, basically, from the lives with the other Valar on, and Mayar on the West Continent, Aman. Let me see if I find Kimberly 80's artwork of Oromir, just so we can show something off here. I think that is uh, Oromir with Nahar, his horse. And um, yeah, he, he lives there and Horses from there were kind of quite intelligent. In addition, there were also some hounds like Huan. I think he's originally there and he somehow got into the into the fellowship, you could say, of um, some of the sons of Feanor and went over from um, the West Continent, Aman, to this place. And it's again, a, oh, this is a second age thing here. We need a first H1. Yeah, so to Beleriand in Middle-earth, here it is. And as a result, being potentially associated with Orome, he had some um, interesting abilities. He was a magical dog. Yeah, that is potentially the, the short version. Uh, sorry, what video about Rings of Power? Um, I made a video about misconceptions about the 20 Rings of Power recently on this channel. So if you like to know what are, do these rings actually um, do or so, um, you can find it uh, here. It's not about the TV show, it's just about what is written in the books about the Rings of Power. Yeah, it, it, uh, to put it simple, exactly. It's uh, basically, the, it, it's a very... Um, mythological story with Huan. I'm not sure if I have an artwork of Huan, to be honest. Let me just see this here. I would like to see the Silmarillion for that, because there we find the information um, that we need. Maybe we can, I, I can find the particular section. So there's the Sindar, Beleriand, Realms, Noldorin, Beren and Luthien. So there we should find some parts about Huan. So, it was like a particular section I was looking for. It was also like um, uh, Karharos that he fought and there was like another story. I hope I don't uh, mix up all the stories because it's, it's always a bit um, difficult to remember that. And what was the... Like Sauron, like we have the story of Beren and Lucien, and Lucien later is basically on her way with um, with, with Huan, and you know he was allowed to speak three times before he died. And there was um, also some kind of prophecy uh, regarding um, Huan. The problem is a bit, I can't fully remember where this was found, like scanning currently through the Silmarillion and trying to find um, 
the earliest mention of Huan. So here, here for example, um, now the chief of the wolf hounds that followed Keligorm was named Huan. He was not born in Middle-earth, but came from the blessed realm, for Orome had given him to Keligorm long ago in Valinor, and there he had um, followed the horn of his master before evil came. Huan followed Keligorm into exile and was faithful, and thus he too came under the doom of the woe set upon the Noldor, and it was um, decreed that he would meet death, Ah, uh, here it is. But not until he encountered the mightiest wolf that would ever walk the world. So he had to fight against the, the mightiest wolf and only by that he could be um, slain. So um, that's very interesting um, to see. But it has nothing to do with the speaking. I'm not sure how it was phrased. Unfortunately, maybe somebody in chat knows um, what it is. Ah, here, I think I found it. Uh, Lucien spoke often to Huan in her loneliness, telling of Beren, who was the friend of all birds and beasts that did not serve Morgos. And Huan understood all that was said, for he comprehended the speech of all things with voice. But it was permitted to him thrice only ere uh, his death to speak with words. So um, here we have this particular line. So this, I think, clearly indicates that he could speak, but there was like a limit put to that. It's an, like a very mythological motif, in my opinion, that we have uh, with Huan here, that he was only allowed to speak three times. Three is also like often in many cultures, religions and mythology, a very important number and so on. And if you can only speak three times, you kind of have to make it count when you speak um, before you die. Probably you avoid speaking. That's kind of a very... <laughs> kind of interesting motif at all like um, you would live forever when you would never speak kind of if this prophecy holds true but um, due to him being like a friend and faithful um, some dire situation might require him to speak and then he has to use his few words he is allowed to say that's um, kind of Interesting. There's, of course, like something similar in existence with, not with a permission though, but with, that are also able to speak that are the great eagles in comparison. So um, that is quite uh, interesting. Yeah, only the greatest wolf. He would uh, die later when he um, fought the biggest wolf ever, exactly. Um, Karcharos, I think, is um, he pronounced. But there's another werewolf. Forgot the name. Trau uh, Traugluin, I think. And Sauron also transformed into a werewolf. Had also a name. I forgot that name as well. I have to reread this story, I, f I feel, because I just forgot so many names. But Draugluin was the initial werewolf. And I, I, I wasn't it like that also Draugluin was also permitted to, not permitted to speak? Yeah, they, they could uh, speak as well. Like his last words were to Sauron warning him or something like this of Huan, if I remember correctly. Let me just see if somebody knows in chat the name. Yeah, the creep who forcibly wanted to marry um, I mean Lucian. Yeah, yeah, Kaligorm. 
they both wanted to uh, do their stuff. Also, that's strange why this one message was taken down. There was no link in it. Very strange. Whatever. Whatever. I'm sorry for um, that. So, yes. To answer the... Draugruin Dra uh, Dra um, was the first werewolf. Yeah, that is true. Let me just look up how the Sauron name was. I forgot. I'm very curious. I think there was also a name for him. Wolf's up. Maybe there was no name, I just remember it wrong. No, I can't find it right now. It's not doesn't matter too much. But yeah, um the Great Eagles and if I remember correctly, also in the Silmarillion, Tolkien later decided no, I don't like this idea. Yeah, here we have it. Um but uh, Manwe Sulimo, highest of the uh, and holiest of the Valar, sat upon the borders of Aman, forsaking not in his thought out uh, the outer lands, for his throne was set in majest majesty upon the pinnacle of Taniquitil, the highest of the mountains of the world, standing upon the margin of the sea. Spirits in the shape of hawks and eagles flew ever to and from his halls, and their eyes could see to the depths of the seas and pierce the hidden caverns beneath the world. Thus they brought word to him of well nigh all that passed in Arda. Yet some things were hidden, even from the eye of Manwe and the servants of Manwe, for where Melkor sat in his dark thought, impenetrable shadows lie. So... That is a very interesting um, detail here in the Silmarillion that Tolkien basically said that the great eagles are also spirits, so most likely something like a, a Maiar, like Gandalf, but they just took instead of the shape of men, they took the shape of eagles and um, served Manwe in this shape and could fly around and have also this mystical vision where they could even see through the earth. And that is... Um, an idea that T Tolkien later changed a bit somewhere, where he said, okay, maybe they are not spirits, maybe they are just also beasts, but very intelligent. And however, in Lord of the Rings, it is implied that they could speak as well. So the idea of beasts, animals speaking, is not that unusual in Tolkien's world. And like there are, of course, mythological um, and even fairy tale inspirations for um, speaking animals. Even in the Bible, you find... Um, one, I think one instance I can think of of a speaking animal. Maybe there are multiple, but there was this weird, it's a very weird story with um, a donkey or whatever the correct English term for um, it is. But yeah, it's kind of fascinating. Uh, Karcharos was yeah the big the biggest and most powerful of the uh, of these werewolves. But yeah, Juan to answer this question on on screen, he could speak. The question is, do I have an artwork of Juan? That is what I wanted to um, look up actually. I think Ted Naismith has one, right? Yeah, we have several, actually. Let me just look which is the biggest one. 
they have all the same size. Why do I have it multiple times? I don't know, chat. But here, here we have um, Juan fighting um, Carjaros, who swallowed one of the Silmarilli, and with that also the hand of Beren. And um, there they fight. It's more that. But there's um, another cool artwork of him that I also really like. So shout outs to Ted Naismith for allowing me to use his artwork. Pretty amazing. This one here I really like though. It's one, it's one of my favorite Ted Naismith artworks. Um, I have to admit. Uh, Francis, hi and thanks for uh, doing this. Yeah, glad you are um, enjoying the stream and the content here on this channel. So much, much appreciated. But it seems it is not too unusual. Why he could talk is a very complicated question. So as I said, it seems Tolkien wanted to reduce the amount of <laughs> ask and AI. That's also a good, uh, good thing. We might do this in a stream as well at some point that we maybe make also a little, I don't know, we, we ask chat GPT funny questions and so we could do this in a live stream as well. But um, yeah, it's interesting that Tolkien seems to be, seems to want to reduce the idea of the spirit of these Maiar becoming animals. And that is the reason why they can talk a little bit because Maiar are just very powerful in Tolkien's world. It might be um, the reason. Uh, Ted Naismith is my favorite Tolkien artist. That is, um, I can com totally understand this. I have to admit, I like Ted Naismith um, a lot as well when it comes to that. But I also like um, Jenny Dolphin quite a bit. I like what she's doing with her art style, um, even though it's very different, but I, I kind of like it. Also Kimberly 80, of course, which I also often use in my um, works here. We have seen the Oromo artwork of her, which I like a lot. And I also really like Ellen Lee's and John Howe's stuff as well. Like, I mean, these are like Ted Naismith, Ellen Lee, John Howe are the gr big, great Tolkien artists, and they do just really fantastic works. But yeah, it's, it's really hard to pick one of them, in my opinion. But for sure, Ted Naismith is uh, also one I appreciate quite a lot. But so, with, with his speaking, animals not being Mayar anymore in some later writings, it seems that Tolkien, yeah, allowed the beasts in his world or the animals in his world to speak for whatever reason. And that is um, interesting. Yeah, that is true. Ted is best for ar architecture and landscape. Yeah, I agree on that. Jenny Dolphin uh, rules the characters. Yeah, that is true. Also, I mean, Kimberly 80, for example, doesn't do many um, architect much architecture in her um drawings. She's also more focused on like character portraits, which he's really good at. But um, yeah, I I like what she's doing there often as well. Like her Kirdan artworks, one of my favorites as well. You have great artist stuff on your channel. Yeah, thank you. Much appreciated. And as I said, I only use artists work when they allowed me to use their, their works and Usually the deal is I credit them for that. So there is, are always links in the description of all my videos to the artists that I use there. And you can find their galleries and maybe browse a little bit through it or so. Jenny Dolphin or for example, Sara Morello also, I like her works um, quite a bit, um, also does commissions. So if you want to um, have a commission um, or give a commission to her, then feel free to do that. Um, Kimberly's nas last name is, uh, I don't sure what her last name is, but she calls herself Kimberly and then 80, the number 80. Here in the credit thing, you can see it. She has a, um, what is it pronounced? How is it pronounced? Deviant art? Divined art? I forgot how the pronunciation of this word is. Um, but let me just post the link in chat so you can check her gallery. She often um, does quite a bit of, um, yeah, she usually takes inspiration in, uh, she often takes uh, inspiration for um, deviant art. Okay.
And we have to consult the Cambridge Dictionary as well at times. Deviant. And in US is the same. Okay. Thank you for the um, hint. Perfect. So, um, yeah. What is correct? Yeah, much appreciated. As said, not a native speaker, and sometimes the English pronunciation is surprising at times. But I hope this kind of answers the question. I don't know. There might be. De I think that if we would go deeper into this whole, could why did Tolkien ch um, ch switch from the idea of speaking animals being Mayar to not being Mayar anymore and just speaking animals? That is potentially a topic that's a bit too deep for the stream right now. Like, I would have to do some research on this. Be I can't even remember where Tolkien wrote that with the great eagles. So let me, maybe I can find a hint here in Tolkien Gate. Where was the, in the, um, in the, um, they have a credit section. Okay, that is interesting. So in a very late text from Nature of Middle-earth. Oh, that is interesting. It is from the 70s. Okay, let's maybe dive into that a little bit because I find... Is there a page number by accident? That would be great. Footnote number three, Manwes Ben. That is interesting. So we have Manwes Ben, footnote number three. The text is from 1970. So the text located among the last writings which Christopher Tolkien dated to the last year of his father's life, see 12, page 377. It is written in a clear hand in black nib pen on the uh, verses of two sheets of a printed Allen and Unwin publication note that is dated February 1970. It arose in connection with and was originally a part of the text Lord of Findel II that was published in um, Peoples of Middle-earth, so the 12th History of Middle-earth books, page 378 to 82. A very fascinating text, by the way. I supply the beginning of the first paragraph of this text printed. And there in footnote 3... Let me just read footnote three. Moreover, the Valar had... No, that's not a footnote three, that's wrong. His messages could come from Valinor and did so, and though in disguised form and issuing no commands, they intervened in certain desperate events. It's a sentence, and here Tolkien has a f made a footnote, which is here called footnote number three, and it reads footnote number three, the most no notable were those Maiar who took the form of the mighty speaking eagles that we hear of in the legends of the war of the Noldor against Melkor, and who remained in the west of Middle-earth until the fall of Sauron and the dominion of men, after which they are not heard of again. Their intervention in the story of Mylor, Melkor, Interesting. In duel of Fingolfin, uh, in the in in the duel of Fingolfin and Melkor, in the rescue of Beren and Lucien is well known. Beyond their knowledge, were the deeds of the eagles in the war against Sauron, in the rescue of the Ring Finder and his companions in the battle of the, of five armies, and in the rescue of the Ring Bearer from the fires of Mount Doom. So Tolkien confirms that those. Eagles that did all of that that I just read at the end are actually Maiar in this very late 70 text. And if I rem and luckily there is like a fascinating footnote here. Ah, 
Okay, here's the other quote. That's pretty awesome. It's a Morgoth ring. And that Tolkien has changed his mind. And I think he... I'm not sure if he included it there. It's in Mistransformed, page 409. I have to get my book, though, because I don't have my digital version page numbers. Be right back. You know what? I just get all the books that we might need. Index, People of Middle-earth, Jewels of Rome, of the Jewels, Morgoth's Ring. Okay, got it. So 411, it, uh, 9 it says here. It helps me a bit in finding it. In that case, elves as a source are very unlikely. In that case, elves. That should be not many sentences in Morgoth's ring that start like this. There it is. Okay, found my digital version as well. And let me just move the chat on the second screen so I can read this here to you people without not seeing chat so much. Oh, Mark is here. Welcome. Nice to see you, Mark. Did you just mention, mention Finrod? Um, yes. But in a different context. It's more about the current question is on screen was Huan a talking dog? Okay, I think I found it. Like there's a section where Tolkien discusses um, several things here. But again, would Eru provide fear for such creatures, for the eagles, etc.? Perhaps, but not for orcs. It does, however, seem best to view Melkor's corrupting power as always starting at least in the memorial or theological level. Any creature that took him for lord and especially those uh, who blasphemously called him father or creator became soon corrupted in all parts of things and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. It goes into the wrong direction here. Yeah? In summary, I think it must be assumed that talking is not necessarily the sign of the possession of a rational soul or fear. The orcs were beasts of humanized shape uh, to mock men and elves, deliberately perverted I uh, perverted, I converted in, wait a minute. In my text, there's, I think, a little error here. Ah, it's a slash. Okay, that's why. A deliberately perverted slash converted into a more close resemblance to men. Their talking was really reeling of records set in them by Melkor, even their rebellious critical words. He knew about them. Melkor taught them speech, and as they bred, they inherited this, and they had just as much independence as have, say, dogs or horses of their human masters. This talking was largely echoic, for example, parrots, um, in The Lord of the Rings, Sauron is said to have devised a language for them. The same sort of things may be said of Huan and the eagles. They were taught language by the Valar and raised to a higher level, but they still had no fear. But Finrod probably went too far in his um, assertion that Melkor could not wholly corrupt any work of Eru. Now it goes into a different direction. However, this text here indicates a little bit that um, Huan and so on had no soul. It seems though the other text, like in a later text, Tolkien um, contradicts this at least a little bit. This is from Mistransformed 8, if I see this here correctly. Let me just check this here. Yeah, 
Mistransformed 8 in Morgoth Ring, in case you want to read this yourself uh, at some point. Currently, does somebody in chat know when this was written? It's always a bit difficult to find that out. The present text entitled Orcs is a short essay, very much of thinking with the pen, found in the same small collection gathered in a newspaper of 1959 as texts 3 and 6. Like them, it was written on um, Morton College papers of 1955 and like text uh, 6 it makes reference to Finrod and Andres. Yeah, this text is from 1900, um, titled Orcs is from 1959, 55 to uh, 59. So in case people wonder when that is. The other text I just read before from uh, Nature of Middle-earth, though, um, is from 1970, so a much later text. It seems Tolkien has, at least when it comes to the eagles, um, changed his mind when it comes to this. Again, back to the idea that they are actually a uh, Mayar in the form. And the other text, he said, spirits. I'm not sure how it's phrased in the original Annals of Amman and so on, if he also says spirits or Mayar there. Here in this note from footnote 3 in uh, P uh, Nature of Middle-earth, it says definitely they are Maiar. So those Maya who took the form of mighty speaking eagles. But it does not include Huan here in this case. However, it is interesting to see that um, Tolkien had like this philosophical thought about that the Valar, uh, or that these creatures were not able to... Um, that these creatures were uh, able to speak, but not necessarily have to possess a spirit or soul affair for it. So, um, very interesting. It's a complicated question. We looked a bit into it. I hope this could kind of answer your question. So, it depends on at what date you look at it. Was Huan a talking dog? In, let's say, in the 50s he was. Maybe in the 70s he might be a also like some kind of spirit in the form of a dog or something like that. I think though it's more likely for Huan that he is not a Mayar, be simply because he is limited in what he can say compared to the eagles. There is like lies a huge difference in my opinion. He could still be, but yeah, it's it's interesting. And also interesting that um, the, the werewolf could um, speak. Is Huan on the same level of Beorn in some way? That's a good question. I think um, no, because Beorn is like a shapeshifter. Like he could speak and he was actually a man and a bear at the same time, while Huan could not change. There is a term werewolf and were is like old English for men. So men wolf, I guess, is the translation. And um, that basically means that there may be a crossbreed between men and wolves. I don't know how this might have worked, but um, they are just more powerful wolves and it seems like the werewolf could also speak if we think about um, um, the, the other powerful werewolf, which name I always forget. It starts with a D. It's not Kajaros. It's the other one. Why am I so bad at memorizing this name? Uh, it starts... Man... Werewolf. Uh, Draugluin. I don't know why I can't uh, memorize this name. It seems there is, there are at least in the Silmarillion hints at that um, these werewolves were basically inhabited by some form of dreadful spirits. That's maybe the reason why they could talk. Let's let's maybe double check the quote on that. Is there a page by by any chance? Oh, of course not.
Grauglun escaped, fleeing back to the tower. He died before Sauron's feet, and he, as he died, he told his master, Huan is here. Now Sauron knew. So that is basically sad. Sauron brought werewolves, fell beasts inhabited by dreadful spirits that he had imprisoned in their bodies. That is how um, the Silmarillion describes them. I would say the good Huan was basically the good version of that and it was not that there were spirits imprisoned in, in, in the body of Huan. So yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of difficult to say if he was a Maya or not. You know, Draugling. Thank you, Alex. Um, okay, so I hope this question... This took a bit to answer. Next question is a bit um, easier to answer. Um, I just don't want to skip about the other question. Let's maybe bring both on screen, which are a bit faster to answer than this one. This is a very complicated question. Sorry that, like, sometimes it just, just takes so long to go through um, all these uh, questions here. So, next question. As said, um, if you had a question posted already, feel free to repost it um, at some point because sometimes it just takes like half an hour to answer a question. So, uh, in, in some detail at least. Only a longer question here. So was Gollum a hobbit is question number two. And three was what untold side story would make for a great new Middle Earth movie adaption? Um, both fantastic questions by Aris Aurelian. Um, was Gollum a hobbit? I would say yes. Gollum was most likely um, counted towards the hobbits because basically we know Gollum is a Stur hobbit or one of the Sturs. And the question is basically, are the Stur hobbits? And this is, um, I wouldn't say difficult or easy to answer, but we only have to go to Lord of the Rings and check, um, and basically check what Tolkien writes in the prologue concerning hobbits. Before the crossing of the mountains, the hobbits had already become divided into three somewhat different breeds, Harfoots, Sturs, and Fellowhides. So let me just repeat, before the crossing of the mountains, the hobbits had already become divided. So Tolkien clearly indicates here, in my opinion, that those three hobbit breeds are also hobbits and not like some form. The only, dis dif like the only detail I would might add to this question is that the term hobbits um, um, is, is divided from the old English term that the um, people or the ancestors of the people of Rohan used, like Theoden, um, later basically um, Hol, uh, Holbütlan. Let me just see if I find this. Are, um, are not these the halflings that some among us call Hol, um, Holbütlan? And then um, Master Holbütler, he cried. At length, uh, Mary came out of deep dreams. And there's another dialogue. Farewell, Master Holbütler. That's like a, a dialogue of Theoden. Let's see if I find it.
Mm, interesting, the quote I'm looking for, I don't find. Maybe they are written as, as spelled a bit differently. It must be this one here. It cannot be doubted that the witness of the meeting, dear friend, said Serian. So these are the lost ones of your company, Gandalf. Um, the days are fated to be filled with marvels. I are, uh, already I have seen many since I left my house, and now here before my eyes stand yet another of the folk of legend. So he says his ancestors in the legends of his ancestors, basically, they are called these halflings, um, uh, Holbütlan. And this is basically derives the word hobbit is derived from this old English term. And we know that the ancestors of Rohan that spoke old English maybe have lived, let's say, around about thousand third age. So if we go further back from the third age, it is very likely that the halflings didn't call themselves hobbits yet. So from this perspective, it might be right to not call them hobbits at a time where this term hobbit was not established yet. But um, that's basically... Um, yeah, exactly. Um, Tolkien... Uh, uh, Tolkien also mentions this in Appendix F and he says... Um, um, here it says, Men called them halflings and elves perianas. The origin of the word hobbit was by most forgotten. It seems, however, to have been at first a name given to the halffoots by the fellowhides and stores, uh, given to the halffoots by the fellowhides and stores, and to be a worn down form of a word preserved more fully in Rohan, Holbütler, Hole Builder. Um, Tolkien writes in Appendix F. So it's whole builder, not a uh, dweller there. So I think also a dweller translation in this context somewhere. However, um, yeah, it, it was like that the hobbits at some point, if we look at the, um, let's maybe use the third age map. And the hobbits lived here somewhere very early on. And the ancestors of Rohan, I made a mistake lived up here in Framsburg and also in this region here somewhere. Don't know where exactly, but close to the hobbits. And it must be that the people, the ancestors of Rohan and the people of and the hobbits met at some point and the hobbits adopted the, the language of the people of Rohan. And as a result, many hobbit words are very similar to the words of, that the people of Rohan use. And there's like similarities in the world. So this language connection they share is an indicator that they must have met and the hobbits must have adopted the language of the people of Rohan. Maybe also the people of Rohan adopted the language of the hobbits, but I see this as more unlikely because the hobbits are just very um, secretive um, creatures that don't play a big role. So it seems strange that they would, the people of Rohan would adopt their language, but yeah, it, it's a fascinating topic. Next question though. So else we never make it um, them any further. So what story I would find interesting to see adapted here? Um, what, like I would like to see, for example, um, the whole story when it comes, for example, to the third age of the, the Wars of Angmar, I think that is a very fascinating story because there's quite a lot to it, in my opinion. Like, you have a lot of different factions, you have betrayal in a way, you have like a, a, a strife that was even before these wars that split Arnor in these three kingdoms Arsadain, Cardulan, and Trudawar, and um, which we uh, also like. I can't show it here on screen well because I can't, I would have to bring up my, my Adobe Premiere to um, show this. But let's say here, surrounding in this region, we had these kingdoms and so on and so forth. And Angmar was further north. So that is a very interesting story how the setup of it, like it has, there's some complexity to it. And there are many interesting details. And I could definitely imagine that the Angmar story um, would be. Uh, it would be pretty cool to see, like, in an adaption, I think. 
because Tolkien also wrote quite a bit of it. We have some dialogue even from this time, which is great. So um, I could see that people could um, work um, with that quite well. It's also tied, like we know the the Witch King of Angmar already. It is tied to this. It's in the Third Age where also Lord of Rings plays. You don't have to explain too many um, previous things, I think. A few though, but not all of them. And also Tears are nice to see you here as well. Welcome. Glad you ma could make uh, make it as well. So from this perspective, I would um, definitely say that, yeah, the Angmar story is uh, a no-brainer. Like, it must be adapted in some way. And we got a news recently that the that Warner Brothers um, and New Line Cinema want to make new films that are somehow connected to the Lord of the Rings universe or play in the Lord of the Rings universe. I would assume that we will see at some point something like that if they get if there's no complaints by Tolkien um but by the Tolkien estate I think we could definitely see the Angmar war at some time. Kinstrife would also be not that uninteresting I have to admit. But I think um the Angmar story is just uh, even more interesting because the Kinstrife went on for quite some time. You have to establish some concepts, I think, for that as well, why it came to the skins drive and so on and so forth. So yeah, also welcome, Mr. Man. Um, was your message deleted because you missed a space or something like that? I can still read it though if I see it, um, but yeah, now I could see your message. Um, welcome as well. Um, let us move on. So there were some in other interesting questions. I hope I could answer all your questions, Aris Aurelian. It just took a moment or two or three uh, to do so, but that is the nature of difficult questions as always. So let us see what other question. Well, that's also a really good question by um, Stefan. Very early question. How did Saruman come to live in the tower? That's also a really good question, I have to admit. So, um, very short after the war, like, if, if I... Exactly, Saruman became not a steward, but a lieutenant of Gondor. And after the war of the Rohirrim, Gondor noticed it had not the strength to guard off. Let me just pull up the map. Then we go to the other question because it's fast. I can, I think, answer it relatively fast. I always think this, but um, yeah, if you look here, here's a gap of Rohan and here's Eason, um, guard or Eason Yard or Isengard, however you want to pronounce it. And, um, Let's move up the map a little bit. And you see, um, yeah, Gondor was at this time busy doing other things and fights, and they had no cap capabilities left to send help um, to the people of um, Rohan, to, to, to King Helm Hammerhand, and he was attacked by the dune landings from here. And there's then the long winter was there, and we have the horn. Hornburg story and so on. So there's a lot of things going on here. And after that, Gondor, like Saruman, suddenly appeared in Rohan, praising the valor of the um, of the people of Rohan and um, basically suggesting, what would it wouldn't it be great if I take this tower here that was previously um, conquered by the Dune landings and they gave you a lot of trouble. How about I just live there and protect the gap of Rohan a little bit? 
And the people of Rohan said, yeah, that's pretty cool, but we can't give you the keys, we don't have it. This place here, even though it's close to Rohan, is still part of Gondor. So Saruman went to the steward at this time, I forgot which steward it was, unfortunately, and asked him, hey, can I, uh, wh what do you think? You have trouble defending um, this place, like the Gap of Rohan, how about I go there and do that for you? And they said, well, that sounds very wise. And then they gave him the keys and Saruman just moved in. And from this point on, Saruman lives in the tower of um, Orthanc in Isenyard and uh, protects the Gap of Rohan and can start his treachery here, uh, from here as well. So quite fascinating story, which I can also recommend uh, rewatching where we talk about this particular detail quite a bit. So for people interested in this topic. Um, where's Mr. Chad? Here it is. I made a video about this. It's Elrond part 9. There we, who's Elrond part 9? We discuss exactly um, this. It's probably later in the video though. We go to the complete story of Rohan and they being attacked there in this one. So yeah, and, and to do this, um, Saruman uh, became indeed a lieutenant of Gondor um, and became the lord of Isenyard for that time. At some point when Gondor got weaker, he said, yeah, whatever, Gondor, I do my own thing here now. I, I don't care about my me being a lieutenant of the steward of Gondor or whatever. Maybe I can find it here in Appendix A really quick. problem with lieutenant is I never know how to spell it. <laughs> it's, kind of, it's one of those words. I think I got it right. Yeah. In this way Saruman began to behave as a lord of men, for at first he held Isenyard as a lieutenant of the steward and warden of the tower. So that is what um, is written here in the book. And yeah, also in this long winter, the people of Rohan were reduced um, quite a bit and so on. They had a lot of hardship put onto them after the long winter and the war. And fortunately, I did not prepare the other question I wanted to potentially look into. Maybe Chet knows this a bit better than I do. Um, so it's basically about um, Gandalf in the books discussing with Aragorn where to go. and. In the film, Gandalf is against going through Moria. In the books, though, um, it is Gandalf who suggests going through Moria. And um, I think the question at least implies uh, this. Okay, I could have maybe put this a bit differently. Um, when Aragorn did to uh, go to Moria, uh, so he, Aragorn is against this. And it seems like implies that when Aragorn did go to Moria and um, if he had already been there, why did he seem like he did not know the way though uh, through it and why not help Gandalf guide them? That's a really good question, I think. It's from quite long ago. <laughs> Still the left hand, okay. Thanks for the link too. No problem. Glad I could answer your question. Yeah, in German, Lieutenant is Leutnant. That's also what I did. I searched the translation for Leutnant and then copy pasted Lieutenant and then searched in the book. But yeah, it's just me. So let us see where they discuss this. So this is basically uh, when they are on Karavras, on the Redhorn Gate, Redhorn Pass. Let me see if I find a screenshot of that that I can show you to uh, on the screen in the meantime.
Of course, I'm an idiot. That is my mis biggest mistake here. So maybe you remember this scene here from the films where they were defeated by the mountain and had to return. And um, yeah, then they discussed, okay, where do we go? Like, we don't want to go through the gap of Rohan because Saruman is there. Um, and then in the books, it's suggested that uh, it's about... Uh, that they take a different path. The question is... It's, it's potentially here. Let me see if I find um, the quotes here. Uh, the road I speak of leads uh, to the mines of Moria, said Gandalf. Only Gimli lifted up his head, a smoldering fire was in his eyes. And all others uh, a dread fell and the mention of that uh, at the mention of that name. Even to the hobbits it was um, a legend of vague fear. The road may lead to Moria, but how can we hope that it will lead through Moria, said Aragorn darkly. It is a name of ill omen, said Boromir. So here um, they uh, basically discuss it in the book. And um, now we have to figure out how... I know that uh, Gollum went through Moria, so he knew the way. Gandalf also at some point must have been there, kn knew the way. I mean, he's he was potentially there when Moria was... Um, still not uh, destroyed so that is definitely helpful i guess but um a very good question It is mentioned here, but it is not mentioned when he was in Moria. Does somebody in chat know a reference for that? Uh, they never used the main door. That is also a good um, point. I thought that was um, the door um, that gave them trouble. Too much small for the dwarves, I guess. Also a good question, why didn't the Balrog show up? I think it was like a fateful meeting between the both of them, and usually Balrog is not interested in anybody passing, but Gandalf, of course... Um... Is, is quite interesting. But it's, it's interesting to know, when was Aragorn going through Moria before? I would have thought maybe on a search for Gollum would be a possibility. I, I would, that would be the most likely um, thing. Hunt for Gollum. It's a really good question. What, how how Ganda, uh, how Aragorn knew about Moria? His previous visit.
Good question. Where, where could we find this information? I don't think we find it in... Like, we only know that at some point, I think in 3001, Gandalf said to Aragorn, you have to find Gollum. And then he started searching him for a long time, but Gandalf, uh, Gollum was captured before he could... Um, before um, Aragorn could capture him. He was he went to Mordor and there he was captured by um, Sauron's servants. But I, have to, I assume I would assume that um, Gollum at some point maybe went to Moria and Aragorn might have followed or something like that. And then he went through Moria as well. Somebody in chat have, have, have a clue for that because that's really difficult. Uh, I believe Gandalf was once in Moria before, when he's searching for throwing. Yeah, that is that is true. Like Gandalf was definitely in Moria, and he could have lived uh, before that as well. Also, welcome, Suchan. Nice to see you. AI time. That's a good. That's a good question. We could ask the AI. But that is a really good question. Maybe... Where could we find the answer? Okay. The only thing I found here is the following. At some point, either before or after the colony of um, Balin, Aragorn entered Moria for some unknown purpose. But it seems like it's never really mentioned anywhere why. Okay, it's an interesting idea. He also visited Los Lorien at times. Maybe he went through Moria. Might be possible. So kind of interesting. And maybe there is no answer to this. But yeah, um, I don't know. It, it seems... I'm currently just trying to find stuff, but I have to admit I I'm I have no idea when Aragorn exactly was. It is definitely possible that it's never stated. So the answer to your questions, unfortunately, I don't know. I have no clue. Um. Um. That. Uh, how how Aragorn knows this.
So, um, yeah. Good Gimli, said Gandalf, you encourage me. We will seek the hidden doors together and we will come through. In the ruins of the dwarves, in the ruins of the dwarves, a dwarf's head will be less easy to bewilder than elves or men or hobbits. Yet it will not be the first time that I've been to Moria. I sought there long for Throin, son of Thror, after he was lost. I passed through and I came out again alive. I too once passed the Dimriel gate, uh, <clears throat> Dimriel gate, so that is the east gate of uh, Moria, um, said Aragorn quietly. But though I also came out again, the memory is very evil. I do not wish to enter Moria a second time. <laughs> I also like Pippin's answer. And I don't wish to enter it even once, said Pippin. But um, yeah, it's... It's very interesting. Once passed, he said not entered the Dimriel Gate, he passed it. So he potentially went however he entered uh, Moria and went out at the end again. I guess maybe really searching in the search for Gollum, maybe also for whatever reason he had need to get to Los Lorien. And that is how he got there. He just entered it. So just to show it you on the map. Like uh, Khazad Du Moria is here. And the um, Dimriel thing is here at this side. And Luzlorian is down here. So relatively close. Otherwise, I have no good, th no, no, well, not a good theory for why he was there or when he was there. So very good question, but potentially Tolkien never give us an answer to this because I just really was silent for a moment and really checked stuff and tried to find something. But it seems Tolkien never mentioned it um, when this was. I think this is potentially the only mention of it. That's kind of fascinating. Perfect image. Hey guys, is Ongolian the strongest being in Middle Earth? She um, thirsted for the two trees. Um, a good question. Short answer. No, definitely. She's definitely not the strongest. Well, let me just see how I phrased your question in Middle Earth. Like, um, Ungoliant later does not potentially like she. She's very briefly. She very briefly lives in Middle Earth. A long time she lived on the different continent. But I assume you mean just of the world. And then Eru, that is God. He is for sure the strongest. You can make an argument if she is stronger than um, than Melkor. I don't think so. I think she just had the... She, she was very powerful for sure, but she surprised him. And then he could almost defeat him. But I would say on paper, Morgos is stronger than Ungoliant, if that makes sense. I guess if Ungoliant surprises him and spins him in with his nets. I mean, in a way, um, she was not able to kill uh, or eat Morgos because his Balrogs came and saved him. You could say, uh, what does difference make this, does this make? Melkor or Morgos had Balrogs as his servant. That shows how powerful he is. Like in Tolkien's world, like power or strength is always also kind of tied to... Um, what you can do with his strengths. And he spread his strengths and got a lot of powerful servants. And when they help him, it is still in his power to be helped and to have um, uh, somebody to to come there. So um, that is kind of interesting. But as a result, I would not say she is the strongest because Ungoliant has no Balrogs coming for her aid. She's just alone. She, like, on a, like as, as an entity, purely alone, she's for sure was very powerful at a certain point. But um, I could imagine that all the Valar together would still be stronger and so on. And Tolkien definitely states that at his peak, Morgos was, or Melkor was stronger than all the other Valar combined. So... Um, or more powerful. It's definitely um, an important detail. And only by them working together and because Morgos spread his own power, um, they were able to defeat him as a sole entity. 
at the very end and just defeat all his servants and so on, or a lot of them. Yeah, still you, have, you must have entered through um, and exiled through the main gate, never went to the other side. Though Gandalf knew the password, he just forgot, I guess. And how maybe there are different ways to enter Moria that nobody knows of. But yeah, I like I said, you, you make a very good point, um, um, Stefan, there, that specific in the um, case of Aragorn entering Moria, he said he passed the the Dimriel Gate. It is the East Gate, and there you don't need a password to enter, to go through it. So maybe he went in there. Maybe looked for Gollum there for a time or whatever reason. I don't know why he went there and then went out again. Very difficult um, to to answer. Uh, thanks, philosophers' games. Um, you're right. I got to consider that Morgoth strong uh, strong as Valar. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Um, that but yeah it's uh of course difficult to say i wouldn't say maybe he was just looking for clues for Gollum because he probably didn't know where to start but i don't know it's it's difficult to let me let me just read your uh, Suchan's mes message here it's difficult to imagine he hunted for Gollum there isn't it Gollum was expected to be much closer where they found him that is true but i guess it's also the misty mountains and there were I know things like it's uh, interesting. <laughs> Maybe he had been <laughs> in to look for malt beer and ripe meat um, of the bone. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, it's true. Compared to Gandalf, we have a relatively small time window when Aragorn could have entered Moria if we subtract his childhood and the years at Aragorn's movements uh, accounted for. That for sure. We only know 3001 he started searching for Gollum and didn't find him. And maybe in this time he might have entered. I don't know. Does the red TPG corner mean something special? Yeah, the red one means it's a live stream. The blue one means it's um, a video on demand law video. And there might be other quest uh, colors in the future, but um, yeah, that is basically the idea. So if you see a red one, it means it is a live stream or was once a live stream and you see it as a VOD now, but that is basically the idea behind my color scheme because the the live stream live button is also red. That's the association, I guess. And blue, I don't know. I like blue. <laughs> this makes me think Ungoliant lived in Amman between the shore and the mountain range, correct? Yeah, in um, Arath Anathar. What was it? What was the place called? Something with an A and Thar at the end. Today my name memory is kind of messed up. I don't know why I can't rem remember the names anymore. I'm getting old, I think. Avasar is the name. Great idea to color uh, your videos. Yeah, I think so too. I guess people, of course, need to know what it means, but on paper, I think it's a decent idea. Correct. Uh, did the Valar know she was there when and how did she um, settle there? That we don't know. We only know, um, let me just see how um, in the Silmarillion it's phrased how she came to the world, I think. So thus unseen, Melkor came uh, at least to the dark region of Avasar, that narrow land lay south of the Bay of Eldamar, beneath the eastern feet of the Pelori, and its long and mournful shore stretched away into the south, lightless and unexplored. There beneath the sheer walls of the mountains and the cold dark area, the shadows were deepest and thickest in the world, and there in Avasar, secret and unknown, 
Ungoliant made Ungoliant made her abode. So it seems it was secret. And uh, recently uh, we answered the question that f fascinatingly ties to it. Um, we talked about the great eagles at the beginning of the Silmarillion. Let me see if I find this again. Yeah, the spirits in the shape of hawks and eagles flew ever to and from his Manwes halls, and their eyes could see to the depths of the seas and pierce the hidden caverns beneath the world. Thus they brought word to him uh, of well nigh all that passed in Arda. Yet some things were hidden even from the eyes of Manwe and the servants of Manwe, for where Melkor sat in his dark thought, impenetrable shadows lay. 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 Lay, I think it's the pronunciation. Um, so this indicates that Manwe could see and the eagles could see through and as, as a result the Valar could potentially see through caverns and see quite a lot but there were some things hidden from them. And we also know from the description that um, that um, yeah um, she was weaving black webs in a cleft of the mountains. Let me see if I find this. Ah, oh, yeah, here we have it in the sentence before. A cloak of darkness she wove about them when Melkor and Ungolian set forth, an unlight in which things seemed to be no more and which eyes could not pierce, for it was void. So I think that it somewhere here mentioned that even Manwe could not pierce this darkness of, of her. So it was potentially very similar and um, in this particular description that he could not see through it. So from this perspective, and Tolkien mentioned that it was in secret and unknown, I would assume that, Ungo that the Valar did not know that Ungoliant lived in um, Avasar. Like, maybe I should also bring up my fantastic map here. And Avasar is, I don't know, somewhere here in the south, I would assume. And maybe if I would move this a little bit better, we can see. So Manwe sits here on the top of Taniquitil, that's this gigantic mountain range here. Then this mountain range is called the Pilori here. It goes from north to south and maybe somewhere here, I don't know, in the mountains or so, Ungoliant hid. And Mekor kind of knew about this. And I assume he maybe didn't know it, but he knew there was a place where the sickest or the dark, the greatest darkness is. And he would go there because he also had this darkness part around him. And, um, yeah. Ah, uh, here it is. But Manwe from his high seat looked out, and his eyes alone pierced through the night until they saw a darkness beyond dark, which they could not penetrate, huge but far away, moving now northward with great speed. And he knew that Melkor had come and gone. So not even he could, he could, uh, his eyes could not even pierce the darkness that shrouded um, Ungoliant. So in that regard, I would say, yes, yeah, she, it was, the, the Valar did not know. Oh. Yeah, here. The elder knew not whence she came, but some have said that in ages long, uh, ages long before she descended from the darkness that lies about Arda, 
when Melkor first looked down in envy upon the kingdom of Manwë, and that in the beginning she was one of those that he corrupted to his service. So he maybe okay, maybe it's even different than I just said. Um, he knew she existed. It seems he knew about her before, and she potentially corrupted her into in his kind of service. But um, yeah, she he noted that she was there, and she. Um, yeah, descended from the darkness that lies about Arda. So sh I always see Ungolian like a black hole, like she's the embodiment of darkness itself. Very um, interesting and epic, I think. Uh, thank you for the answer. Yeah, um, no problem. I think it was your question, which I did not bring up here on screen. Oh, Priscilla TV is here. Welcome. Nice to see you here as well. Uh, Pumpkin Rick asks, uh, maybe also an interesting question. I come to the question of Zushan in a moment, but it's also a fast one. I hope you are not uh, angry with me. Let me just see. Also one. Do you know if they have the rights to do a movie about the War of the Last Alliance in a satisfying way? If they are going to make a new big budget movie, we would uh, need a grand conclusion. That is true. I feel like the Last Alliance stuff could be the ending of Rings of Power. Because um, this last battle also has a tie to the, gr the greatest of the great Rings of Power, the One Ring at the very end where Isildur takes it for his own and I think that could be a um, yeah, pretty powerful shot at the end or so. And um, so I don't think they might do a movie directly with that but I think yes their rights to see this are available either in the form of the Amazon show which people might not like but um, that is but, but all is described in the um, in the books and in the appendices of Lord of the Rings. So, in theory, maybe you need also a bit of agreement from the Rings of Power and um, uh, from the Tolkien estates, like the Rings of Power did. Maybe they need some additional material. I'm not sure um, what's going on there exactly, but in theory, all they need to know is just in Lord of the Rings. And in theory, if they have the filming rights for that, they could make films out of that. So, in theory if they have the budget for it and the ambition and a good script yeah I could see that they make a good film of the last alliance stuff though it has a lot of context a context the battle of the last alliance in my opinion and there's some other material about the last alliance stuff that is not in Lord of the Rings that you might also need to get a bit more context like some information from the Silmarillion and so on which is a bit uh, unfortunate that they would not have that because some of the cool descriptions are from there as well. But overall, I would say there might be enough in Lord of the Rings itself for that. Oh, I forgot to bring you the question on screen because I'm an idiot. But yeah, that was a question. Um, Sushan asks about the endless stairs. So let's maybe look into this um, as well. I'm curious to know how uh, to know more about the endless stair in Moria. The depths must have been well visited once, as it was, uh, as the stairs were built. How was it lost when it goes from uh, the deeps to the mountain top? It's an interesting question, I think. <laughs> do, <laughs> Lime asks, "Do you think um, it?" hurt when Wiggle Mortensen kicked that um that head. Yeah, it definitely hurt. He broke his um toes there as or some of his toes there.
So maybe I just copy the question in a bit shorter. That should help me a bit. So endless stairs is an interesting topic, I think. But also very um quite specific here. Of course. So how was it how was the stairs lost um when it goes from the from the deeps to the mountain top? I think the mountain top back in the day was already kind of tough to visit in a way and very dangerous. Like these days you see if you there's for sure a lot of um uh, maybe not a lot, but definitely accidents happen and people die while doing um, climbing up mountains. So I would assume that uh, doing so um, was was relatively rare even at the time of Lord of the Rings. Like you, that, when you have a, an accident, you just can't call for help, and then. Um, a helicopter comes and saves you or something like that you are just then basically dead and i assume so not many people often climbed on the um top of um the misty mountains in this uh, location um what uh, it was a caleb deal right here yeah, the caleb deal and on top of that um like I'm not sure how it connected inside the mountain to Moria um, itself. So it's difficult to tell. And you have to keep in mind that at the point this stair comes into actual... Um, into the actual... Oh my gosh, he broke his toe. Yeah, he <laughs> read it. Uh, when it comes to um, the Lord of the Rings events, that's what I want to say. Uh, Moria was already abandoned for quite some time. There's somebody in... I think it's 3rd age 1975. 3rd age 1000... Oh, maybe 80? No, 80. Maybe 81. So, uh, Noin the first slain, the dwarves flee from Moria, many of the sylvan elves of Lorien flee south, Amros and Nimrodel are lost. So, yeah, Noin was the son of um, or Nine, however you want to pronounce him. Like, it, if you pronounce it Old Norse, it's Noin, or it's, it's spelled it's spelled so N A I N. Same with the name Dain or Doin, depending on your pronunciation. But it's the A with the um, little diacritic above indicates that it's a long A in Old Norse. The long A was pronounced more like O. It seems. However, the Witch King comes to Mordor and there gathers the Nazgul. A Balrog appears in Moria and slays Durin the Sixth. So there we have, yeah, this is why it's called Durin Spain. That was 1980 and 1981, a year later, or several months later, the dwarves fled from Moria. And when Aragorn later and Gandalf, it is over a thousand years later. So in, in 1000 years, that there was once like um, a staircase that goes from top from Kelebdil down to the deepest depths of the Misty Mountains, that this might be forgotten um, is definitely imaginable. I think we don't really know when it comes to this question when it was forgotten or when it was lost. I would assume, and that's in my opinion a very good explanation, that maybe this particular stair was kind of known at the, at, the, at the height of Moria for a long time, then it was forgotten for whatever reason. Maybe they didn't need it anymore or maybe um, they had some trouble or conflict with weird beings um, down there and then they shut it down or so. I don't know. Maybe there was some dangerous going on. And we, I, I think sadly we don't have any information why it was lost. I can only speculate here. And I would assume um, maybe it was like maybe the, the maybe down was too spooky for whatever reason. I mean, we we have these nameless things that Gandalf mentions, and he says not even Sauron knew about them. Um, I'm not sure if they are good or evil or how they look or whatever, but um, I could imagine that uh, the dwarves also did not want to find out. 
So maybe it was just, okay, let's not go deeper than this. And maybe they only used it to get to the mountaintop. And then after the Balrog basically pushed out all the dwarves there, it was forgotten. That's basically the only assumption I have. I'm not sure if somebody here has a better um, theory than this, but that would be mine. Yeah, that's also a good theory, Iris Aurelian. The dwarves scared each other with ghost stories and started to believe it. Yeah, something like this could be happen. They heard weird noises down there in the stairs coming up, and then at some point it, it became like a story. They started to believe it, and they would never go down there, and then say, let's just seal this thing. Nothing. Want, we won't have uh, anything to do with this with the stair down way in there. Because it's scary or so. I, I don't know. It, it, I could imagine that this might be um, the root of this actual story. I can't... Um, me, uh, like, I don't know if there's any more mentioning of Tolkien, but I assume for, from Tolkien's perspective, it was just a cool element to have this ancient stair that Gandalf has to... Now, now he fell down all the way from the bridge of Khazad-dûm, and he has to get up somehow, and you have to find a good explanation. Said, yeah, it would be cool if this ancient forgotten stair from the depths of the Misty Mountains to the top of Kelebdil um, would be there. That must be would be pretty cool. The dwarves must have found um, the nameless things though, as they built the stair. They had um, ventured to the bottom. Yeah, that is true. They might have explored and found them as well, but they never told anybody, which would be also very fitting for the dwarves to not tell anybody about it. I was Gimli scared of the dead in the mountain? You mean um you do you mean in the in the uh, white mountains where where we have the oathbreakers or what was left there? <laughs> the con the construction dwarfs had life insurance that did not cover death by nameless things, so they had abandoned the project. That's also a good idea. Yes, the oath breakers. I have to admit, I haven't read this section in quite some time, so if um if Gimli feared it. In the films, um they he in the films he had some uh, he was a bit frightened of, of this particular section, but he had enough like he still followed, so I guess you never go into a ghost place and be happy. Okay, but there's only one way through the mountains that will bring me to the coastlands before all is lost. That is the Pass of the Dead. The Pass of the Dead, said Gimli, it is a fell name and little uh, to the liking of men of Rohan, as I saw. Can the living use such a road and not perish? And even if you pass that way, what will so few avail to counter the stroke of Mordor? The living never have used that road since coming of the Rohirrim, said Aragorn, for it is close to them. But in this dark hour, the heir of Isildur may use it if he dare. Listen, this is uh, the word that the sons of Elrond bring to me from their father in Rivendell, wisest in law. Bid Aragorn remember the words of the seer and the path of the dead. And what may be the words of the seer, said Legolas. Thus spoke Melbe, seer in the days of Arvidui, last king um, at Fornost, said Aragorn. And then the prophecy of Melbes comes, and so on and so forth. Uh, dark ways, doubtless, said Gimli, but no darker than these um, staves are to me. If you would understand them better, then I bid you come with me, said Aragorn, for that way I now shall take. 
Uh, but I do not go gladly. Only uh, need drives me. Therefore, only of your free will would I have you. Uh, would I have you come? For you will find both toil and great fear, and maybe worse. I will go with you, even on the path of the dead, and to whatever end they may lead," said Gimli. So Gimli was. It seems like not that much of fear in the book. It seems. I hope that the forgotten people will not have forgotten how to fight," said Gimli. "For otherwise, I see not why we should trouble them." I wouldn't say he's eager to go there, but he would um, follow Aragorn to the end of the world. It seems. So that's pretty uh, cool, but it seems like in the film they exaggerated this a little bit in comparison. But I don't know, does somebody have like um, a different um, impression? Also, Kill Switch, nice to see you here. Good evening. <laughs> Can we take a moment to be thankful that Nicolas Cage turned down the role of Aragorn? This is coming from a Cage fan. Yeah, <laughs> Nicolas Cage as Aragorn. I also, I, I don't see that as well, to be fair. Even though I also sometimes find <laughs> Nicolas Cage stuff kind of funny. Also, Sandro Kligain is here. Welcome. Nice to see you. Long time no see. I remember um, your name from the comment section. I assume you are the same. So, um, yeah. Nice to see you here. There's some nice deep fake uh, Nick Cage as Aragorn pictures. Okay. <laughs> That would be um, potentially very funny. Oh, Paul is here as well. Nice to see you, Paul Freeborn. Hey, Chris, been a while. Glad to listen to you talking about Tolkien again. Yeah, it's uh, pretty... Nice to have you all people here as well. And talk a bit about Tolkien. Today my brain is a bit uh, lacking, I feel. So there are multiple questions. We come to that in a moment. Um, but it seems like, n from my perspective... Let me just see. There's an... Well, that's not my, my errant he cried, turning back and speaking to the whispering darkness behind. Keep your hordes and your secrets hidden in the cursed years. Speed only, speed only we ask. Let us pass and then come. I summon you to the stone of Erech. There was no answer unless it were an utter silence more dreadful than the whispers before. And then a chill blast came in, which the torches flickered and went out, and could not be rekindled. Of, uh, of the time that followed, one hour or many, Gimli remembered little. The others pressed on, but he was ever a hint most pursued by a groping horror that seemed always just about to size him. And a rumor came after him like uh, the shadow sound of many feet. He stumbled on until he was crawling like a beast on the ground and felt that he could endure no more. He must either find an ending uh, and escape or run back in madness to meet um, the following fear. Suddenly he heard the trinkle of water, a sound hard and clear as stone falling into a dream of dark shadow. Light grew low, and um, the company passed through another gateway. High arced and broad, and a rill ran out beside them, and beyond go, uh, going steeply down was a road between sheer cliffs. 
Yet Gimli uh, after Yet as Gimli after learned it was still two hours uh, sunset of the day on which they had set out of uh, from Dunharrows. Through for all he could then tell it might have been twilight in some later year or in some other world. So it seems Gimli was scared at some point quite a bit as well. So interesting. I, I wasn't really sure about this. I just, um, yeah, but no, now reading a bit through the section here, it seems like yeah, that's an, that's another thing here. Um, earlier, um, that is interesting. Um, so time unreckoned passed until Gimli saw a sight that he was um, ever afterward lost to recall. The road was wide and as far, and as far as he could judge. But now the company came suddenly into a great empty space, and there were no longer any walls upon either side. The dread was so heavy on him that he could hardly walk. Away to the left, something glittered in the gloom as Aragorn's torch drew near. Then Aragorn halted, went uh, to look what it might be. Does he feel no fear, muttered the dwarf. In any other cave, Gimli, Glo uh, Gloin's son, would have been the first to run to the gleam of gold, but not here. Let it lie. Nonetheless, he drew nearer and saw Aragorn kneeling while Eladan held aloft both torches. Before him were the bones of a mighty man. Here we have the reference to um, um, the son of Brego, I think, right? Baldor, I think it was, yeah. I think Baldor was the one who um, was found by them. He was um, like uh, like uh, he, potential king of, of Rohan at this time. But um, yeah, his brother then became king, and from that the line continued. He went to the um to the also to the pass of death, and there he broke like his his legs for whatever reason. That's a complicated topic. There's a text in the Vinyar Tengwa that actually describes some detail of that, which I find very fascinating. But yeah, a different uh, topic in question, I guess. But yeah. Ah, nice. Gimli stepping on bones. Yeah. So I guess the film still exaggerated it a bit, but not as much um, as one would think. So quite interesting. The question is if Eldarion is a half elf. That is also a complicated question, perfect image. <laughs> Sander Clegane is here, everybody won. Yeah. Uh, because the oh, it's, it's complicated with the half elven. But it seems like that only I think the grandchildren, like if you're grandfather is a half-elf, you are also a half-elf, but your children are not half-elves anymore. At least, you know, when they are uh, half-elf. So, Earendil was like a half-elf and Elrond is a half-elf, and their children are also half-elf and um, so on. But the children of Arwen are potentially not counted as half-elves anymore. So that's... Um, yeah, the complicated question. I don't want to go too deep into that because it uh, is interesting. But I hope this kind of answers um, the, the, the question here by Tsushan, I think. Uh, poor Gandalf, he would be so spent even before fighting with the Balrog since uh, when he fell, fought, landed and ran almost forever and the Balrog up the stairs to the top of the mountain. Yeah. 
So um, the Valar, no Melkor was like Sendor Kligain um, asks. Let's go with this question because I think we can answer it uh, somewhat. I wouldn't say fast, but I could try to answer it. Just have to do the formatting here really quick. So next question. Uh, the Valar, no, Melkor was turning um, elves into orcs. Why didn't they act sooner? Also knowing that men and elves were fighting against the power, uh, the powers of the Valar, why didn't they act sooner? So that is kind of a complicated question, I think. Um, to answer a bit in, in, in parts, but basically the short answer is a bit that, of course, origin, like for the Valar, confronting uh, Melkor was kind of difficult because Melkor on paper was more powerful than all the Valar together. So it was not like it was an even fight. In theory, uh, Melkor had kind of the edge. Only when he spread out his power, um, he be like he as a Inter and focused entity became weaker and then maybe they were, be were able to actually slowly defeat him. Like Melkor spread his power into the world itself in many servants and so on and so forth and they would need to be able to deal with those first before they could take on Melkor really. And um, that then kind of happened. Then also the Elves awoke before, not before, but uh, not like they awoke at some point and the Valar knew they awoke, but they also had to find them kind of first. So Orome was going through Middle Earth and finding them at some point. And then he said, okay, we have to help the elves. And then the, the, the Valar actually reacted relatively fast when they knew that's the situation that Melkor, because as, as just read um, a bit earlier, let me just try to find um, the section here again. I'm in the wrong book. Chris, why are you so bad? Okay, I found it. So, what we can read, for example, about um, uh, Melkor in this context. Thus they brought word to him of well nigh all that passed in Arda, yet some things were hidden even from the eyes of Manwe and the servants of uh, Manwe. For where Melkor sat in his dark thought, impenetrable shadows lay, uh, lie, lay. I always want to say lie, I don't know why. But it's L-A-Y, um, so it's, I assume it's lay. The, um, this hints at that um, the Valar were not aware of what exactly what Melkor was doing there. And so he could kind of hide that from them. So they had to find out first. They had to find the elves first, ask the elves. And then the elves also had to accept the help of the Valar. And only then they could act. And then there was the so-called, or often called, um, war of, um, war for sake of the elves, I think it's sometimes called where the uh, Valar attacked Melkor and then chained him for three ages. That's like the time calculation, like 3,000 Valian years, I think. Yeah. And, or is it 300 Valian years? 
I don't know, it's complicated with these time calculation stuff. But for a long time, three ages. Ages not written big, but uh, not in capital letters. <laughs> not written big, wow. But um, yeah, it's that's basically how this works. And then later, you ask the question continues. Also knowing that men and elves were fighting against the power of the of, of a Valar, why didn't they act sooner? So la- when this happened, the elves were for, were out of the equation first, and then men awoke. And I assume they also didn't know what was going on with men initially. And then men escaped and came to um, uh, came to Beleriand. Like, if we look at our fantastic map, like Hildorian, where men awoke, was here. Um, then later, uh, they came somewhere here and to Beleriand. And there they together fought. However, at this time, the elves who escaped here to this particular place um, had the kin slaying, the first kin slaying, and killed their own kin and as a result let me just see if i find the um, fantastic kins first kinsling artwork of tnasmis they killed them and then moved on to middle earth against the first of all killing somebody is already the nold for not good and the noldor came under the span and they were warned multiple times and they didn't listen and they went then from here to middle earth and by doing so in my opinion they basically closed the possibility for the Valar to interact. They went to Middle-earth for revenge against Morgoth slash Melkor and they wanted to fight him. And they did this to, to do this, to go for this revenge by any means necessary. And they would not listen to the Valar in this um, particular case. So the Valar could not help them anymore because the elves with their decision actively as- decided against this. So now it was on the elves to fight Morgoth and the war, not on the Valar anymore. Only at the very end, when the elves were basically and men were defeated, and Silmari was brought back to Aman by Earendil and um, Elwing, the parents of Elrond and um, Elros, and only when they asked the um, Valar to intervene, then they acted in the first age and. Um, defeated Morgoth here and kicked him into the void. But the reason kind of is that the decision of the elves before was the reason why they would not intervene. It was now like I would assume if the Noldor would not have left Aman and stayed there, that at some point the Valar would have intervened much earlier and helped the Sindar against Melkor um, over there, because there Melian was, and they she could have informed, I guess, in some way, the uh, Valar, and tell them that uh, Melkor is doing terrible things here, and so on and so forth. Yeah, the they went the the. Initially in the war against it for sake of the elves, let's, let's use this terminology here, they went not necessary because the elves um, asked them, but I think Oromer was there and he ba- basically brought the news and then they decided, okay, we have to protect the elves and then we go to war. But I would assume that the elves told Oromer something like, oh no, at night in the forest, some of our brothers and sisters get missing and are kind of uh, gone. We don't know what happened to them. Something like this. On top of that, we also have to keep in contact that Tolkien changed the origin story for orcs multiple times. So that is um, also a complicated edge case that one has to consider, I guess. I see your point about the Valar. I'm just not sure um, I can agree. Uh, Wait. How does this the half elven stuff doesn't count for the lords of Dol Amros? Yeah, that is true. Like the the I assume the lords of Dol Amros or let's say the children of um, Imrazir and um, what is the name of the woman with an it sta- she starts with an M. Imrazor, not Zir. Me- Mithrelas. To do my, my, my name and memory is just not there. 
you checked out um, AI generated uh, Lord of Rings stuff is amazing. Yeah, glad you uh, liked that video. I was found, also found it very funny. A uh, word says, I got a, a law question. Feel free to post it. But yeah, I hope I could kind of answer the question, but it's always like these questions are sometimes very complicated to dissect into all the different um, parts and so on. Uh, did the Witch King of Angmar know about the Shire? I'm getting my dates confused. The Shire was founded during the War of Angmar. And the deal was basically that the Shire people, the hobbits, uh, maintained the bridges and so the messages, the king could send messages and stuff like that. The Shire was basically a bit or close to the border of um, Arsedain, which was on... Um, What's on the screen? That is uh, the world Arda, and we just checked. Um, um, what is it called? Um, the first age story, so Beleriand in the first age. So it's basically Middle Earth, how it looked in the first age. There was a West Coast section called Beleriand that's dark green, um, added to Middle Earth, how we know it from the, for example, third age. So we just move it back to what um, is it? Are you German? Yes, I'm from Germany. I'm just cur curious, um, there was like some, some um, follow-up question. Um, of Mark, um, like I said, I'm confused if it was directed towards me or another user. Um, so I'm a bit confused here right now, um, if there is any confusion. Are you in university? Currently not, but um, I have seen a university from inside, so yes. It's long ago, like I studied computer science like a decade ago. How long have I been reading Tolkien? I started very slowly reading after the Peter Jackson films came out. I'm not sure if directly after Fellowship of the Ring or after um, the whole thing went through. I can't fully remember if it was like, I think after Two Towers, the, the Peter Jackson Two Tower film, which came out 2002, 2003, something like that. And I intensified my Tolkien reading, let's say 13 years ago, something like that, where I started also reading more Silmarillion and Unfinished Tales and so on slowly. And I make videos since 2017 in March, six years, I make law videos, and this time I have very, I have very intensively um, read uh, Tolkien stuff. Because just to do research on videos and so on. Is it possible that in Lord of Rings, the East symbolizes the Oriental civilization clashing with the Western civilization? That's an interesting question. I think you could interpret it like this, and Tolkien... Um, Let's AI answer a question. We could try and um, if if I get uh, if I can log in. But um, yeah, there's an interview where Tolkien compares the East to, for example, other Eastern cultures. So you could interpret it like this. You could make some historical parallels to the Huns and something like that. There is no Chris. It was um, about your idea that the Noldor exile forced the Vala um, of inaction until um, the War of Ras. I wouldn't say it forced them. Forces maybe the wrong. Maybe I, I I phrased this wrong. Like it was not like the Valar were forced to not do this. I think they decided to not. Um, like that the the, the Noldor exiling. Like it was basically the consequence of what they of what they did. But um, I think we discussed this in a previous stream as well. I can't fully remember. And it's bit, it comes a bit down to opinion here, I think. Um, when it comes to that. But I should 
not skip too much between questions because then I confuse myself a bit. Ah, yeah, we want about the, the Eastern part. So yeah, you, you could compare this in a way, but Tolkien usually didn't like allegory. So you I would see it more like maybe there's some historical inspiration, but Tolkien simply wanted to portray um, a, a conflict. Like to sometimes in your story, you need like a danger that is just, let's say, beyond the mountains, very far away in a distant land. And since we are at the west coast, basically, of Middle-earth, all the danger can only come from, like, we're in the northwest of Middle-earth. So all the danger can only come from the south and from the east, because otherwise they would have to come out of the snow or out of the ocean, if that makes sense. So um, in this way, I would not put too much thought on the geographical direction. In a way, Tolkien, of course, also had the idea that middle uh, that Arda, the world, is basically the mythological version of our Earth, and so in this sp uh, particular context, um, in this particular context, the uh, of course, it, it there must be a similarity to how our world is basically built. So you have maybe you could compare it to Europe and some of the um, eastern regions here, and so on and so forth. So there's that, but it's more on a very more on a metaphysical level, I guess. But I don't think the story is necessarily intended to be. Um, an indication of the conflict of the Oriental forces with um, the Western Europe forces. The reason why I think that is that the conflict against these Eastern foes is just too small. Usually all these conflicts are just historical side notes that happened at some point. But the actual main story has nothing or not that much to do with forces in the east it's just there's somewhere in the east we don't know where exactly there are forces and they help Sauron and Tolkien had also the idea that the blue wizards are then in like in the, in the writing from, from the 1970s so very late in his life he died 73 um, that the blue wizards were actually successful and they helped to prevent that the forces of the east would outnumber the west and so on so there was like rebellion in the east as well, and Sauron potentially had to deal with it there, to maybe explain that okay, if, if these if there are so many forces of eastern people um, coming to this conflict conflict as well, why um, weren't they not outnumber the the west and so on? So, but you you need this kind of for the tension. You need be far in the east there is there are some great forces on Sauron's side. But um, then you also need an explanation why they didn't win in the end, because when there are so many and numerous, why wouldn't they win at some point? And I guess the reason is because also there was rebellion. And I think that kind of is just like, yeah, Tolkien needed a place where other forces are and maybe a danger, like um, is, is being in German would call it a bedrohung, something like this. What is the English word for that? Um, a threat, yeah, a menace, a threat, some, something like this needs to be there without it being fully fleshed out. It's just there sitting at a very distant land at the horizon, but it's not really part of the actual story that Tolkien tells with Lord of the Rings. It's just a side note in it, if that makes sense. So we know so little about the people in the south and in the east. Like it's, They are mentioned and they are also part of the of the um, of the uh, ring of uh, the war of the ring, but more as like, like I said, they are just additional forces. I wouldn't say extras, but something like that. You know what I mean, I guess. Yeah, exactly. That is what I mean. Um, by telling the Noldor, you will shed um, lots of tears. The Vala kind of bound themselves to not intervene until the Noldor had shed all those tears, not before the Battle of Unnumbered Tears, at least. Yeah, exactly. Basically, what this... To come back to the other question... Um, uh, perfect uh, decompress 
from work with uh, Chris live. Yeah, m welcome, uh, learner of law. Much appreciate that you are here as well. No, oh, quite interesting. Um, yeah, to to come back to what you say. Yeah, you are right. In a in a way, I skipped over the prophecy, but in my mind, that was part of my answer. Why um, the consequence was because at this moment, the Valar gave like a warning that this will happen, and maybe you are right. Before it has not happened, they can't help because then their doom or their how to say it, how um, their their whole um, prophecy would not work out with the, if they would start helping early on. But I feel like there was like a warning and then there was like, yeah, Tolkien calls it a, a doom that was put upon the Noldor that went to exile. And this doom the Valar accepted and the Noldor as well, they were warned and they wanted to get under the doom. Galadriel's father, for example, also a Noldor, uh, Noldo um, decided to not go to um, to Middle Earth, even though he was almost on his way. And but he said, "Okay, no, I won't go." And he was not under the doom, so they definitely had the chance to to stop that. But I feel like um, this this battle um, had to do, and it was not like that after the Battle of Unnumbered Tears, um, the War of Ras started. It what what had to happen was that. The Silmaril was returned to Amman, where it was once stolen and um, brought there. And also somebody from both, like uh, like Eärendil as a special case, as somebody who basically represents the elves and men because he's a half-elf, comes there with his wife, also a half-elf, half, a half -elf, um, or half-elven, comes there and asks for the Valar to intervene. And men were even banned from entering um the West Continent, so they are not allowed to go there. But since he's not men only, he's also an elf, he was kind of allowed, and then he had to decide if he wanted to be counted towards men or elves. And only then the, it was time. I think there's also a mention in the Silmarillion where Ulmo basically says to Manwe, we have to help the elves there. And um, Manwe basically says, the time is it's not time for that yet. Something has to happen first for, for this to be possible. So, um, yeah, I hope I could ex probably did a terrible job e at explaining my my interpretation here, but that's at least how, how I see it. That the, the, as you say it, you say you phrase it very well, that these unnumbered tears had to be shed first and then they could help. But I feel like it's also tied to the doom of um, of the Sil of the Silmarilli and everything that is connected to it. Like in a way, was like Fianor was asked to surrender the Silmarilli to the Valar so they could restore the two trees of Valinor, and Fianor said no to it. And with this, he started a basically a new world order with that. And now with the exile and with going there against the will of the Valar, he had to kind of live with the, this new world order and this also included that the Valar would not immediately come for help if anything goes wrong. Like the intention of the Noldor was to besiege Melkor and get the Silmarilli back, like get revenge, find Melkor. It was not to settle there in peace and have a good time. It was there for war. And I don't know, if you bring war to the continent, um, you can't expect that others come and fight your war for yourself. As you say, the, these... In wars, tears will shed, and those unnumbered tears had to be shed first before the Valar would come. And they only came when the elves were act practically defeated by Morgos. So, yeah. I hope that kind of answers, but it's an interesting discussion, I have to admit. And it's just, as said, to be clear here, yeah, that's more my own interpretation here. I think it's a bit vague, uh... I like that. Blame Feanor. Exactly. A at the end, we of course simply blame Feanor. It's his fault. But yeah, <laughs> it always comes down to that. If you have a question in law about the first age, 
the most important part is at the end we have to all blame Feanor. Um, he is it's his fault. It's always the answer. <laughs> Just kidding here, by the way, but um, yeah, it's <laughs> it is true. Now, I wonder after the um, Battle of Anambetirs, did any other Valar go to a Manwe? Uh, can we do something now, please? <laughs> Keep calm and blame Feanor, exactly. How did Saruman um, come across the means to make explosive when everybody had uh, not? His technology seemed to be ahead of Mordor's even. I think... Um, on paper, it's not clear if it's really explosive or how the stuff he forged works. It's just called a devilry by Saruman or a device by Saruman, I think. There's not too much information uh, on that. Oh, no worries here. Also, much appreciated. Thank you for your membership. Also, welcome. Nice to see you here again. Um, the technology, yeah. It's it just, let me just see if I can find the exact quote. I think I only have to sue it. Devilry. Devilry of Saruman, Aragon, uh, Aragon cried. Even as the smoke, as they spoke, there came a blare of trumpets. Then there was a crash and a flash of flame and smoke. The waters of the deeping stream poured out hissing and foaming. They were choked no longer and a gaping hole was blasted in the wall. A host of dark shapes poured in. Devilry of Saruman, cried Aragorn. They have crept in the culvert again uh, while we talked. And they, have it, uh, and they have lit the fire of Orthanc beneath our feet. So that is basically... Um, I think there's some other mention of this somewhere, but I won't find it right now in the book very fast. But um, yeah, that's basically what is described in um, in the book. In the film, we have this um, actual um, black powder scene with with um, Worm Tongue holding his um, his <laughs> candles very close to it, and <laughs> and Saruman pushes him away a little bit. Um, it's a pretty cool scene, in my opinion. Um, I think that is not really described this detailed in the book. It's just very vague. Somehow there was a devilry, a device or something. It exploded. There was an explosion, a blast. There was a hole then after that and smoke. How it worked exactly, we don't know. You have to keep in mind, um, though, that Saruman is not just a man with technology. He's like um, a Maiar of Aule. Aule is the... It's the high angel, the god, like if you consider the Valar as a god pantheon of smithing. And he basically knows craft and knows what to combine and stuff like that. So it's not unusual that Saruman would know or have this, let's call it technology, to maybe create something like this. Also, John, welcome. Nice to see you here. Um, yeah, this is basically... Um, Uh, basically the um yeah the the idea i guess behind it that he's just so advanced and even i mean sauron was also a, a mayar of aule let me just see if we find kimberly 80s aule artworks there's one with his like aule is uh, married to um, yavanna which i always find very funny Just takes always an hour to find. That should work. Yeah, here we have Aula and Yavanna. Pretty cool artwork by Kimberly 80. Um yeah, they like he for sure, like these are like almost like gods on this world, or like in, in the sense of the Rome um, of the of the Greek gods or something like this. Though the gods are quite um, different compared to the uh, Greek gods in many ways, but yeah, th as as such as eternal beings that were that exist longer than the world itself and have contact to the entity like Eru to God who created everything, 
um, they for sure have like very vast amounts of knowledge and are just insanely ahead of everybody else. So it makes sense that Saruman um, maybe uh, has this knowledge how to create um, something that might explode. I hope um, this kind of um, answers the question. I mean, Sauron to some degree might have had this as well. Even knowing about this, we don't know exactly, but yeah, it's he for sure also had a lot of um, knowledge when it comes to that. I guess Sauron um, like made made other devices. Maybe they were a bit different in their how how to say it in their um, orientation, their focus, what they would do with their crafting skills. Like Sauron made a one ring like put his essence into a ring he was maybe more on the magical side and maybe Saruman was more on the practical side doing like combining things and make coming up with something like an explosive I or using expl Gandalf had for example fireworks that's a very very good point by Mark as always um, yeah so Gandalf potentially also knew about explosives already and uh, to what extent is Lord Rings allegorical in terms of real-world ancient forgotten history? I would say Tolkien was not a fan of um, um, allegory, and so I would usually, I guess, phrase it like this. Even though he didn't like allegory, I would say sometimes his writings are definitely inspired by, by um, certain things. The, like, if you read Norse mythology, you definitely notice parallels. Also, of course, Greek, Roman mythology as well. You definitely um, notice um, parallels in, in those writings, sometimes even names and so on. So, um, in, that, in that regard, ancient history or ancient mythology is, in my opinion, um, the, the, like the biggest inspiration for Tolkien. Uh, I do recall Tolkien remarking on the fact that Britain, in, in his opinion, did not have adequate culture mythology and he wanted to um, uh, change that, basically. Yeah, it's exactly that. Like, Great Britain was always, or the, like, was always conquered by different forces and as a result they brought their mythology and culture with and so their own mythology was um, kind of a mixture of this and they had not basically their own stuff like some part was Germanic some part was Celtic some part was um, Roman in a way and then some part was also the Nomans and so on and so forth like that so many cultural influence into the language as the mythology I guess that um, it becomes um, though that Great Britain is a very important like country in a way or um how do you call it, the collection of countries that um, are also very different in parts if you like look at, for example, Scotland and so on. Um, in, in this context, I feel that Tolkien said for not Great Britain, but for England. I think Tolkien made the, um, the statement for England precisely and said, yeah, maybe the Scots have their culture and mythology and maybe the people um, in Wales have their culture and mythology but we here in England, we, we are just, I don't know, a mixture of everything. And he wanted to change this and create um, their own like mythology. And that is why Tolkien's, maybe that is why Tolkien's mythology is at times so inspired by all the others. Because, yeah, he's Tolkien loved, it seems, mythology and um, as he loved languages and was inspired by quite uh, a bit of those. And as a result, you find find traces of these inspirations everywhere. Like he also mixed in some unusual stuff, like the um, Kalevala um, from from Finland, for example. The whole story of the children of Húrin is very inspired by that. But also the Norse mythology with the um, Volsung saga and so on, um, stuff like this. So I feel like you definitely find these traces. A classic uh, example, in my opinion is the name Erendil, who was in earlier versions called Erendel. Let me just see. And um, if we look at the et etymology of the name, 
Let me just see if I find it really quick. Yeah, um, Tolkien used the original Old English name Erendil, Erendil for all drafts previously to Lord of the Rings. And Erendil is the Old English name of um, a Norse hero, let's put it that way. Um, let me just see if I find... Of course, I screwed up here. Let me just see if I find him really quick. It's a bit difficult to find because in Old Norse um, he is uh, called a bit differently. An Anglo-Saxon mythological figure, the morning star or dawn, exactly that is. In Old Norse, he's, it's the Old English name of um, Aurvandil. I'm not sure how the stress is exactly in this name. There are some other um, names um, of this. And there's like a weird story, like I can't, I, I don't um, get it to fully together. But if I remember correctly, like there was Yeah, like he was Thor, um, basically took him, like maybe he transformed into an eagle or something, took him and they flew through the sky and doing this his um, his toe stuck out of this basket or whatever and was frozen and then Thor broke it off and cast it into the havens and then it became um, uh, a star that was called um, our Vandil's toe and it, it's of course not the same as Tolkien writes it but Erendil flying through the air, becoming a star himself. That is very similar from Norse mythology. And of course, there's an old English version of this myth where he's called Earendel. It's very similar to this. So you can definitely see that um, he took some inspiration here um, in, in this particular um, detail. So that's, in my opinion, always quite fascinating. All, also, the amazing bad boys here. Welcome. Nice to see you here as well. Aren't gunpowder, bombs, fireworks similar in construction since Gandalf had fireworks? Yeah, it's a very good point here. So they are, I guess, distantly similar. And if Gandalf knew this, and Gandalf was not a Maya of Aule. So, um, yeah, that's a very good point, MS said. <laughs> Tolkien forgot the English imperialism mythology. <laughs> Yeah, another good example, uh, Killswitch brings it up here. Even the even Gandalf and the dwarf names in The Hobbit um, come from the poetic Edda, exactly. There is in the... Um, that's a good question. I think it's also in the Volsung Saga. Um, there's a section that's often called the um, Dwargatal, I think. Um, the dwarfs, basically the, the tale of the dwarfs. And there's a very long name list in it. Let me see if I can find it really quick. That's a question how I find it. I found it. That was easy. Yeah, it's in the uh, Voluspa. In the Voluspa it is um, in the Edda. And yeah, if you um, uh, look at it, um, you've uh, you find all the names like Efili, Kili, uh, Undin, uh, no, uh, Noli, Epti, Vili, Han. It's like a, it's an insanely long list with dwarf names. Some lists, um, like it's a bit complicated with the list because there are two sources for it. One is, I think, in the um, like there's one source for the poetic Edda is the so called um, Codex Regius. And then there's also the Hauksbock and oh, Hauksbock and this the Hauksbock was uh, written later and then includes I think on this section a few additional names that are not in the Codex um, Regius. But whatever, it goes too deep into these kind of things. Maybe you have to ask an old Norse expert on this. I'm just uh, briefly familiar with this, but we find all the dwarf names in this um, text from. I don't know when it was written down, the 12th century or something. 
even Bombor, Nori, B4, B4, Bofor. Bofor is interesting. Bofor is a very interesting name here, by the way. If I see this right, maybe somebody who is an absolute Old Norse expert. No, it's not. I'm like the um, character in, Lo in, in The Hobbit is called Bofor, right? Before Bofor, Bombor. This in this order, we find it exactly like this in the Edda, and the name. Um, why you know why this is interesting? Maybe I show it to you. In in chat. Okay, that doesn't work as I hoped it would. And let me just see. What is very interesting here, I think I found the ultimate hint. Or maybe it's not the ultimate hint. Maybe it's just an inconsistency, I'm not sure, but it's an, an interesting discussion point now that I see it for maybe a completely unrelated question. Like, it is written like this. Before, you see it's written Bafur, but it is a long A in Old Norse, that is why it has the diacritic above. And it's pronounced not um, Bafur, it's pronounced Bofur. So Bifur, Bofur, Bombor. Interestingly, Tolkien writes the name um, not Bafur in his work. He writes in, like he, he writes him actually uh, Bofur with an O. So this could be a hint. Or maybe you could make an argument that if Tolkien would have intended for um, the name Dain, or, or doing, which the name also is in the Edda, by the way, would be intended to be pronounced as um, as doing. That you might might have spelled it with an O, actually, but really hard to tell. But it's an, it's an interesting thing I never noticed. Just noticed now seeing the names. Also, in the Hobbit films, I kind of liked uh, Bofur uh, quite a bit. So, aren't the wizards like personification of the gods? Oh, that's a complicated um, topic. Is uh, Bombor... Uh, yeah, Bombor is the uh, heavy one. <laughs> But yeah, it's, it's interesting. But however, he still t um, used the um, diacritics of these names. You see them also spelled with um, two R's here. I'm not sure if that's the same in in, ru in the um, in the rune script of the, these names. No, in the rune script of the names, they are also only spelled with one um, letter. I'm not sure why it's transcribed as this. There's potentially a good reason for that. Or oh, it's a shortcut letter. No, it's a shortcut letter for double R, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the explanation. Oh, is it not Nori? Well, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not an expert in rune script of Old Norse, so can't tell you too much about this. It's just an interesting side note here. A gander means stuff. Want plus. Uh, Alf, and that is Elf, so went Elf, exactly. Gandalf is also from Old North. He's here, though, um, I think in the text um, written with an R at the end. Yeah, Gandalfer. Veiger og Gandalfer. Vindalfer. Throin. Decker. Thorin. Thror. Liter og Witter. Nar og Nuraver. I said my old nose is not that good. But yeah, that is how um, Gandalf is written um, in it. What event led to the naming of Moria? Yeah, somebody asked another question about Moria here a moment ago. 
Yeah, uh, Nova was it. It's interesting that Tolkien chose to use uh, Moria on Balin's tomb. So it appears by this stage in history, Moria was the accepted name. Yeah, it's it's a bit complicated, unfortunately, with the term Moria. Um, maybe we can explore this. So no, uh, we we use this as a question to answer because it's a very interesting one to talk about for a short moment. Probably have to at some point make this kind of better or so if we need a little box or so for the question, but yeah, it's a bit of manual work for me always to switch up the things. Yeah, Gloin is the father of Gimli. Like in Old Norse, the name the O and the I is not a diphthong, so they don't become Gloin as many people would think. In Old Norse, it would be Gloin, like two syllables instead of one with Gloin. However, I think it's difficult to say. Like, the names are also a bit different from how they are actually spelled in the Edda. So you could make an argument that it's not supposed to be pronounced Old Norse. But since I like the Old Norse stuff, I usually pronounce them Old Norse. But I would not say it's wrong to pronounce them Gloin or um, Thrain, Thrain, however you want to pronounce them in English, instead of Throin. But yeah, I just got used to it, and so on. And it's very interesting to the wiki page for a list of names of Odin. Tolkien must have been inspired. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, let us come to this question here, because there is this very strange circumstance here that we read. And um, I think in the Silmarillion, let me just see if I've, if it's in Lord of the Rings or in the Silmarillion. It's, 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 maybe it's in Lord of the Rings. Yeah, in the Silmarillion we find the following line in the chapter The Sindar. Um, Greatest of all the mansions of the dwarves was Khazad-dûm, the Dwero Delph. Or, um, <laughs> I don't, I'm, I'm very reading the elvish name of it very rarely, but it's um, Hazodrond. Hazodrond. It's it, syllable. It stresses on the O. Hazodrond is, I think, the pronunciation. Hazodrond in Elvish tongue. That was afterwards in the days of its darkness called Moria, but it was far off in the mountains of of, of mist beyond the wide leagues of Eriador, and to the Eldar came, but as a name and a rumor from the words of the dwarfs of the Blue Mountains. So. Here in this text, Tolkien writes that um, in um, that it was only called Moria uh, afterwards in the days of its darkness. Moria means black pit because the dwarves were gone. It was pitch black because of the Balrog. Interestingly, if we go to Lord of the Rings, we find a contradiction to this and that we find in the chapter... Um, let us see, uh, of course, a journey in the dark where they go to Moria and then they come to the door of Durin. And this door, as we know, was made by Narv uh, Narvi and by Celebrimbor. And like just to use a uh, artwork of Celebrimbor by Jenny Dolphin, shout outs to her. I like that a lot. Um, and we haven't seen her art yet. He was he made this writing on the door of Durin, and um, and it's kind of strange that on this door, and Celebrimbo lived in the second age. So c let me just calculate one thousand six hundred, one thousand.
what is it? 200, uh, 1,800. I need a, I need a calculator. 1,800 plus 1,980 or 81. 3,780 years before, roundabout, let's round it a little bit. Um, it's over 3,000 years before what we just uh, read in the Silmarillion, before, um, let's say, um, that was afterwards in the days of its darkness called Moria. So over 3,000 years before its darkness, Kilibrimbo uh, already wrote on this um, uh, on on this door, uh, the emblems of Durin, he cried, and so on and so forth. Then Gandalf explains these are the Ithildin that mirrors the starlight and the moonlight, and so on and so forth. And there's a translation um, somewhere here, which I currently struggle to find. Ah, here it is. I'm just blind. Um, they say only the doors of Durin, Lord of Moria, speak friend and enter. And underneath, um, small and faint is written, I, Narvi, made them Kilibrimbor of Holin. Holin is, the, is one of the names of Eregion. Drew these signs. So, we remember these lines. But it's interesting that it says, Doors of Durin, Lord of Moria. Why did Kilibrimbor call his friends from Khazad-dûm, Boria. And you could ask, maybe that is the translation of Gandalf of Khazad-dûm, but um, on the, if you read the actual things that Tolkien has written down, the Tengwar that is written on the door, you read Moria, like in fact there is Moria on the, written on the door, not, not Khazad-dûm or the um, other name that I forgot. Let me just bring up the doors of Durin really quick. And with quick, I need a moment. Finally, that took a moment. Sorry for that. Here we have it. And yeah, it is um, quite a fascinating detail that um, it is written like this on the door, because it makes like if this name is if this name is true, then it was like that. This kind of contradicts the notion that it was afterwards called Moria, because it seems three thousand years before the fall of Moria, it was already called Moria as well. So maybe it was like. I don't know, a term. This might be simply a mistake Tolkien overlooked or something like this. Very hard to say. <laughs> the main god in Lord of the Rings is Eru. It's the only god in Lord of the Rings. The other um, entities like uh, Manwe or... Melkor and so on are Vala or Valar and they I would compare them to angels something like this like there's a pantheon of angels or sometimes you could also refer to them as gods or something like that but uh, Tolkien later decided there's only one god in this world and the others are basically the servants of this one god just to answer this question really quick What does the runes uh, really say? Uh, no, uh, it really says Moria. You can I can try to read this, but it might be difficult because the spell. So he has written in the Fenorian characters according to the mode of Beleriand. Um, Enun Durin Aran Moria, Bedo Melon Amino. Um, I assume it's an I. Im Narvi Hein Echant Gelibrimboro Eregion Taithant Ituithin. No, that's a seawing. 
I'm not sure how this is pronounced. W H is very rare. I, I read this. Can maybe look it up. I think there was a change of sound when W when you see W and H. Forgot what it was though. W No, it's H W, right? But yeah, something like this, it should be pronounced. HW would be a voiceless W, that. As in English, white. Okay. As a Finno Urgic speaker, I find it funny that I understand Quenya, at least um, some of it, should add to. <laughs> Uh, to my LinkedIn uh, profile. That is true. <laughs> like, Quenya is very inspired by Finnish, so in case people wonder. Yeah, it, I guess there are several interpretations of um, why this is used. I, I personally think it's simply an oversight by Tolkien. Maybe he wrote Moria... Like, you have to consider it this way. I'm not sure when Tolkien wrote this exactly. We could find this out. It would probably take too long here for the stream, though. Um, I assume he wrote it in the 40s, roundabout. I assume the text that we read in the Silmarillion, he wrote most likely in the 50s. And I, I, Tolkien had no computer. Like, everything he had to write with hand or on a typewriter. I assume he simply forgot that he... Um, wrote this sentence, I wanted to change it later in Lord of the Rings and forgot or something like this, we don't know. Maybe he could have changed it to um, the other name for Moria, which is um, um, it's Hathodrond, that's how it's pronounced. I always have to think where the stress is. I think it's on the Hathodrond. It's on the second O. Adodrond. Found it. But yeah. Uh, why did they expect dwarves in the movie? So um, in Moria, um, when they go through this door, they expect dwarves because there was a so-called expedition of Balin. Balin, the dwarf we know from The Hobbit. He's very old at this time. And in the books, uh, uh, Balin is actually younger than Thorin. Like Thorin in The Hobbit is already 192 years old. I don't know out of my head how old Balin is at that time. Let me just double check. He's also older, but not that old. He's at least old enough to live at least um, 60 more years. He's born 2,763. 2,941 he is. Let's double check the date here. 2,763. He's 178 already. Wow, he's really old. He dies 2,994. Uh, so 231 years old. That is really impressive. But yeah, he's a bit younger, like 20 years younger or so than um, Thorin Oakenshield. And he goes with some dwarves on an expedition to retake Moria. And there they establish. And that is what Gimli basically means. That, yeah, Balin is living there and he's established a colony there. Um, maybe we will um, find those dwarves. And um, that is that, like, he hoped, like... Um, Gimli hoped to to be, simply meet Balin there. And of course they were all dead at this point when they came there because they were overrun by the orcs and so on. He, all that was left of this was basically the book that they found in the tomb. In the um, in the chamber of uh, uh, what is it called? Today my, I don't know what my name memory uh, my memory to 
chamber of um, start with an M. Mazarbul, yeah, Mazarbul. That's the name. Just, I know what's. Sorry, chat. I'm today. My name memory is simply not there. But um, yeah, it's. They find this thing. It's also in Lord of the Rings. We can read some information there. It's kind of interesting. I read the other day um, um, from Christopher Tolkien that his father couldn't afford 100 pounds to pay for Lord Rings to be typed up, so he did it himself, and it exploded into many times the size he intended. Uh, that's that's an interesting story. I didn't know about that. I didn't know that, but I don't remember it. That's an interesting detail. At the Council of Elrond, Gloin explains that uh, no one had um, heard from Balin's colony for 25 years. Yeah, that is also um, definitely further detail. But um, I think the, the some of these time details are removed from the films. And so I from this perspective, when you just remove all these time issues, like also Bilbo's birthday was 17 years ago, something like that. Um, like I, I assume, Book Gimli mi might have not expect, uh, expected to find somebody. Maybe he hoped he would find um, Balin there, but and at least learn the truth what what might have happened there. But yeah, I guess Film Gimli um, potentially for Film Gimli it makes it could have been a shorter time, and then he could have expected this. I think that is um, a detail we should differentiate here, of course, the Film Gimli and the Book Gimli. Oh, it's, allu um, it's alluded to that Balin was hoping, yeah, exactly, to find one of the dwarven rings in Moria. The reason for that is that nobody knew what happened to the ring of Thror. Like, in secret, he gave it to his son Th um, Throin, Thrain, Thrain, and um, he, on a, his expedition to Eribor, was captured by Sauron, and this way Sauron got this dwarven ring. But nobody knew, and Balin hoped to find it in Moria, because they thought Thror, who actually also went to Moria alone with one servant, um, I think it was uh, Noin, Nine, and um, yeah, it's in this regard uh, quite complicated, but um, yeah, he hoped to find, he assumed the dwarves that killed Thror in, Mor in Moria, that he got the ring from Thror this way, and that is why he went there and hoped to find the dwarven ring there. I assume. Or maybe he hoped or assumed that um, the dwarves were... Um, how to phrase it, chat? That the dwarves were... Um, like... That it, c it could have also been initially lost. I'm not sure how f if Bali knew what exactly happened with the rings of power after the fall of um of Casa Doom initially back in like thousand years ago i i'm not sure to be fair in modern money it's like 4000 pounds yeah that is <laughs> that is also true like in if if you if you um calculate Infl inflation in 100 pounds might not sound that much, but I guess back in the day, 100 pounds was quite a bit of money. That for sure. Kind of interesting to see. But yeah, probably more like 4,000 pounds, as you said. 
Yeah, four thousand. I found a I found a table and it also says around about four thousand pounds. So <laughs> you might be right there, even, or you look, uh, or you just know the inflation stuff really well. Uh, also, Mark, thank you for staying so long. Um, sleep well. I know it's already late in Germany, so much appreciated. Glad you uh, enjoyed the stream. Oh yeah, Stefan also wrote this about um, the ring. Was Gandalf the only Istari to return to Valinor? We don't know for sure what is with the blue wizards, but in theory, yes. It seems like Radagast did not return. Saruman was banned when he died, kind of. Um, and we don't know what with the blue wizard attempts. Like in the latest version from 1900 round about 1970 from peoples of middle earth uh, the blue wizards are actually successful in their mission in the east let me just uh, read this um yeah here we here, here we read um they must have had the blue wizards must have had a very uh, had very great influence on the history of the second and third age in weakening and disarraying the forces of east who would both in the second age and third age otherwise have outnumbered the west there's uh, some words missing here in this sentence that could not be read by christopher tolkien but you make some uh, dots here and there but um yeah it's here in this version they have success so in theory, they could return to the West as well. It's not documented that they do, but why would they not return to the West when they are successful in the East? But only in this very late version that Tolkien wrote very shortly before his death. So, I don't know. I know it's only in Lord of Rings cinematic universe, but a uh, need that Gimli finds and uses a Balin's axe. Yeah, that is actually a neat little detail. I agree on that. Uh, back to question um, let me just switch here my screen back um, back to question what would happen to an orc or goblin if they were obtained the one ring I think they would simply give it to um, Sauron because they would be controlled by it and at the very end um the ring wants to return to his master in, in any way and they were loyal and under Sauron's will to, to, to some degree anyway so I don't see that the servants of Sauron would be able to keep it and do something with it I think they would just um, bring it to, to Sauron in, in some shape or form uh, it's, it's not 100% clear um, I, I don't think they get pushed out it's, it's a bit um, learner of law um, it depends a bit on interpretation here I think so failed Istari join Melkor in the bad place do uh, the door of night I assume you mean yeah um, I don't think so directly I think Radagast is an immortal being he would just stay in Middle Earth until the end of time so the Istari are also immortal beings so I would assume if they are not slain or anything they would also just stay there and it depends a bit. Like with the Blue Wizards, there's also a version where they fail and either also become servants of Sauron or even um, or just form their own mystical cults. That is, Tolkien writes this in a letter. In this case, if they follow Sauron, they might also get banned from Valinor. Radagast did not help Sauron any shape or form. He even opposed him. He's just he's not, not knowing what happens with him. And so on. So I assume he just likes the nature of Middle Earth there and just stays to live there. I don't know. And does his own thing. I don't think he would be particularly banned from Valinor. I don't. I, probably hard to say if Tolkien. I'm not sure if Tolkien ever put a statement on what happens to Radagast later. Saruman. There is an indication that it's kind of similar to what happens to Sauron when he loses the, or when the One Ring is destroyed, because. Um, 
Yeah, we read it uh, in some stream in the past as well. We talked about this particular section. Let me see if I find hideous skull. Yeah, that should be right. So, uh, to the dis when, when Saruman died, we can read, To the dismay of those that stood by, about the body of Saruman a grey mist gathered, and rising slowly to a great height like smoke from a fire, as a pale shrouded figure it loomed over the hill. For a moment it wavered, looking to the west, so to the west continent where the Valar reside, uh, just as a bit of context here, but out of the west came a cold wind, and it bent away and with a sigh dissolved into nothing. So I assume this means basically he was, like when, when his physical form was destroyed, his spirit could not return to Valinor, it was basically pushed away and maybe even put to like impotence and um, maybe even forced to wander without power um, over Middle Earth until the end of time. I don't think though that he was pushed through the doors of night. The doors of night are act also in the west, so um, and the gates of morning are in the east. But um, yeah, I, I don't think they were pushed out. He, I think he's just forced to wander on Middle Earth as a as a ghost, basically, that can do nothing. Like a diminished shadow. Sim I am, I am personally interpret it, it, it's a similar fate of as uh, compared to what happens to Sauron when the One Ring is destroyed. He's also just reduced to nothing almost. It becomes like only like a, a shadow that has no power and can't regenerate from the state anymore. Um, Doors of Night. Maybe I'm not sure if um, this is a follow-up question. If not, I can show you maybe an image somewhere. Let me just search it really quick. It's basically like sun and moon go or leave the world through these doors like the doors of night when it becomes night the sun and moon goes through or the sun goes through this door and at the other day at the gates of morning it comes back into the world that's basically how the world works this might have changed after the world got um uh, after after the world got bent the oceans got bent and the world became a sphere but let me do it like this. I don't need my arrow here. But here's a work artwork of the cover. The, this is the cover of the Book of Lost Tales Part Two, and here we see basically the doors of uh, night, like a gigantic door. The dragon figurines. I think that is also mentioned in the Book of Lost Tales. How it a little bit how it looks. Later, it's just not much described, but um, yeah, something like this. And here we see the ship of Erendil. Who is guarding the doors of night? So that's basically how they look. The artwork is, I think, by John Howe. If I'm not completely mistaken. Yeah, it, it says here. No, it's just volume, not John Howe. I just read John. <laughs> but yeah, um, no, I don't have rights to this, so I just show you the cover of the book and recommend it, of course. It's about Tolkien's very early mythology uh, and writings from like, I don't know, 1916 or something. Very interesting book. Okay. I think there's still a lot of other questions, right? If I just need to scroll up a little bit. Uh, 
and see if like if there's probably missed some question as said feel free to re-ask uh, questions again if i have not answered them yet i won't stream that long anymore because i slowly get tired so that is not really good but um yeah maybe one or two more questions or so we could still um do or discuss some topic we had like a lot of discussion today felt a bit unorganized but um yeah Okay, there was like a very early question here in chat about where did I find out about the red hair of um, of Maidros? I guess I first saw a lot of artworks before I realized that he has red hair, I guess. But it is mentioned, uh, mentioned in the um, Silmarillion, I think. Not sure if I find the particular thing I have. Maybe it was also in um, some of the History of Middle Earth books. It's like a, another name that basically means um, copper top, which is reflecting his... I'm not sure if that's in the Silmarillion, though. I don't think so. No, it's just from a other note of Tolkien. It would be in Peoples of Middle-earth. It describes it as copper. Let me see if I find that. No, not in the Silmarillion, at least. But I would have to find the, the exact quote for that. Did someone say I? AI? Oh, the AI question. I know, is there an interesting question we could ask the AI? That's quite quiet, so I'm not sure, but um, yeah, it might be... I, I forgot how, it's, how it was phrased. But there was definitely... Um, somewhere a mention of Maedros having um, red hair. Hmm. Only says, I throw the tall, Magla the mighty singer, whose voice could be heard.
Hmm, very strange. Uh, Drone Wars, right? Um, I tend to forget what the ends did after the Battle of Isenyar. Couldn't they have helped the forces of good in the final battle, or was it cause of their stance that they couldn't? That's a good question, to be fair. I guess they had to guard Saruman that he doesn't break out because Saruman wasn't dead, um, which is different a bit in the films. Though only in the extended edition, I think it is shown that um, Saruman dies there. But um, yeah, I think that might be um, the best explanation for what is uh, for for what is going on there. And after that. They potentially try to reestablish their forest. Up a circle it. I'm just a bit sad that I can't find this. Red handed, red blood, red mole. Might not be in the Silmarillion. Maybe it's just, it's only in Peoples of Middle Earth and it's mentioned that his hair is red. I'm not sure though, to be fair. I could swear there's a reference to that as well. I simply can't find it, but it's kind of difficult to find this on the fly when you don't know exactly where to look. I don't know. If somebody knows in chat where the quote is to find. Feel free to post it. I'm, I can't find it right now. At least not in the Silmarillion. Unfinished tales. It's it's easy. Uh, it's easier to find uh, unfinished tales. Um. Uh, Peoples of Middle Earth. It's easier to find. But yeah. Um. In early writings, where it's still called uh, Maitomo, um, as an akif, a, a passer given, a passer given by um, his brothers and other kin, which is um, Rosandol Copper Top. So that hints at his hair being like copper. Um, on separate, uh, Nedal's father was an Aulendil Aul 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 and became a great smith. He loved copper and set it above gold. His name was uh, later Samo, but he was most widely known as Urundil, copper lover. He usually wore a band of copper about his head. His hair was not as dark or as black as was for most of the Noldor, but brown and had glints of coppery red in it. Of Nerdanel, seven children, the oldest and the twins, a very rare thing among elves, had hair of this kind. The eldest also wore a copper circlet. That, uh, the eldest son of Nerdanel is um, is Maizros. So here we have clear indication for for the uh, copper for the reddish hair. 
it's, uh, I said it's, it's in peoples of Middle Earth. It's easier to find, but I'm not sure if in the Silmarillion there is a thing there. They were too busy searching for the Endwives to help. That's a good point. How did Saruman even lose if he was so powerful? Restricted magical power? I mean, his army simply got beaten and he was not powerful enough to deal with the, um, with the ends, but still it was, of course, dangerous to deal with Saruman because his voice could be very convincing. You always have to think about um, what power means in Tolkien's universe. Like, Saruman was able to have an army, a big army, under his control and um, make his army attack others. And this, of course, was um, a very important detail in this context because that that is very powerful. If you can bring like a big Orc or Urukai army under your control and um, yeah, basically even breed it in the first place, equip it, and then attack something with it, that's definitely... So, yeah... Of course, he also has some mystical powers or magical powers over the world, but that was not the whole thing. Like, it was not like he was a one-man army and was going to destroy everything. He was, like, having his realm, his tower, his fortress, um, Isengard or Thang, and from there he bred his orcs, created an army, and made his move. And his orcs got defeated, and then also the ants attacked, and he couldn't stop them. And so he was imprisoned in the tower. And later um, he convinced um, the ends to let him go because his voice, as said, he could even convince the Nazgul, uh, the witch king, I guess, that um, the One Ring is not there and that they, sh and they, sent him, and they sent them in the complete opposite direction. And it was not even questioned by the witch king or anything because that shows just how much power his voice had. And... It was definitely almost magical what he could do with that, but or maybe it was magical. But it was not like, and he could later then convince a Treebeard to let him go, and this is how I think the whole um, scouring of the Shire part um, comes to be, basically, where he sets up like a like his ruffians, and then they attack the Shire and take control over it, and then Frodo, Sam, and the others have to take control back, and so on. That is not in the films, but there's a more well, at the very end. There's a, a chapter called the Scouring of the Shire, of the Shire. So yeah, that is um, basically yeah what his powers are. I guess he he knows craft. He has knowledge. He can convince others. But he, as said, he's less a fighter. He's more I wouldn't say a statesman, but something in this direction. Yes, and that is what I guess. Uh, power means in this context. Of course, you don't want to meet him 1v1. He's a powerful angelic being if he... But he's also kind of limited because he's an Istar. And um, we can read in the Unfinished Tales that these powerful angelic beings, the Mayar, um, that became then the Istari... Let me just, yeah, it is. It's in the chapter called the Istari. For they must be mighty peers, uh, they must be mighty peers of Sauron, but must forego might and clothe themselves in flesh, uh, in flesh, so as to treat on equality and win the trust of elves and men. So, uh, you know, it further says, but this would imperil them, dimming their wisdom and knowledge and confusing them with fears, cares and wearinesses coming from the flesh. So they had to take a specific form to become, to go on this secret mission and become the East study, where they where their power was diminished and reduced anyway. And maybe sometimes they could come back to their full power, but they not always um, had it available. If that makes sense. Okay, other questions? I do have a question for... I could try to log in into ChatGPT. I can't promise though that it works right now. 
it works. So, are there any um, wishes for for that we sh that we might ask? Maybe as a final question because we did like a video. Some people liked it, so I don't know. Any suggestions, chat? Also, if people um, are still here watching and awake and alive, if you haven't pressed the like button, maybe um, do that. Would be much appreciated as always. Also, when we have later this video as a VOD after the stream ended, feel free to write a comment and stuff like this also helps the channel quite a bit. So there is uh, that. Else I have maybe have to take an old question. That's a good question. Somebody I'll ask ago, would a ring made by Morgos would have an effect on Tom Bombadil? <laughs> that's, that's a good question. I, I can't answer it and impossibly. Why is Tom Bombadil unaffected by the ring by the ring? Because he's more powerful. But that would be too easy, um for the bot, I think. A new subscriber, can't wait to go through a video. Saying, um, welcome and nice that you found your way um, to my channel here. Um, I don't know what where you should start, but that's quite... Oh, Reflective Rambling is also here. Frequently hop in, in at last min, I assume. Uh, we're currently looking for a question that we might at the very end ask Chat GPT and maybe discuss what Chat GPT has to say. I just have to um, extract my chat window here really quick to make this go. But if people would be interested in asking, yeah, exact, exactly. If I haven't made it this far into the video, you're still not subscribed. I, I don't know what I have to do. Also, thanks for some of the likes that people are pressed. But yeah, welcome, Reflective Rambling. Nice to see you here. Now, currently, I work on the Who is Elrond videos, which probably are very detailed. But yeah, I don't know. You will definitely find cool content here on the channel. Maybe check also the recent stuff. I don't know. But I'm very happy that some new subscribers have found the channel here. Only good half three hours. Well, they're very long. At some point, when Who is Elrond is completely done with all parts, it will be nine hours long, and I will make one nine hour long video. Do you smoke? I don't, but I always wonder which uh, Tolkien fans might be inclined after reading how much of the characters do. No, I do not, I do not smoke in any shape or form. And never have. Never felt um, the need to um, start with that. Uh, how else can we support you? Well, um, as always, um, I personally, uh, I, I'd like to um, recommend this Galadriel video. Yeah, I, those are also pretty good. Oh, great, Rebo is here. Welcome. Nice that you made it here at the very end as well. But yeah, other ways to support me. There are not that many, I guess. Basically, if you write a comment under my videos, or I don't know, ask a question there, whatever, that already helps. Pressing the like button helps. Recommending me to other people helps. If you're looking for monetized stuff, then you can get a channel membership here on this channel. Maybe watching the ads for 30, um, 30 seconds or I don't know, have YouTube Premium, that also helps. On Twitch, you could, in theory, also subscribe on Twitch, that also will work. If you have Amazon Prime, you can, like, uh, connect it. <laughs> uh, you can connect your Amazon account to your Twitch account, because Twitch is was bought by Amazon. And um, if you have Amazon, you get, like, one free monet, uh, monetized subscription for Twitch. A bit complicated to explain. But yeah, all this stuff kind of helps. But yeah, maybe chat, maybe I make you chat voting. Um, 
Um, we haven't done a vote. Uh, did you people like the um, chat GPT video? Yes. No. I don't. I don't care. <laughs> that are the options you have right now. Very curious to maybe get an idea. I have premium and, and the channel membership, so Gribo is um, top tier here. <laughs> Only those bubblegum cigarettes that blow. <laughs> so, okay, it's funny. Is Dwarven Ale a thing in Middle-earth? That's a question. That's a good question. It might be. Poll fail. All polls should be yes, no, don't care. Potatoes. <laughs> hmm, okay, it seems like so far people um, liked it at least a little bit. How old is Gollum? 500 year-ish? That's a good question as well. Not sure if we should ask the bot the question. Maybe that's a good bot question. I'm not sure if his birth date is very well known though maybe the problem with this question might be depending on the source for his birth date might be a problem i'm not sure if it's recorded when he was born exactly I wouldn't wish Goblin, uh, Gollum would um, see his potential and become the Goblin King. After miraculously surviving Mount Doom. So how does one uh, go about the channel membership? So there must be somewhere when you're watching a a membership button or something like this and there are three tiers you can select one which costs different amount of money then 75 percent of that money goes to me and 25 go to youtube so there's definitely a split but it's one of the better splits to be honest like on twitch it's more 50 50 so yeah there's always that Soon, Master Elf, you will enjoy the fabled hospitality of the dwarves, throwing fire, small beers, and meat uh, of the bone. I think, though, that's a, a, that's a movie quote, right? Let me just double check something ale. Like the hobbits had ale? Butterbur talks about ale. Like the dwarves could have known ale from Brie.
Mm, Pippin talks about ale. So he definitely, I'm not sure if dwarves make ale, but they definitely would know about it, in my opinion. Because the one problem with the dwarves is that they are very bad at creating food. That's why they initially, for example, very early on, um, allied with the uh, dwarves. So um, there's that. Uh, Twitch is like 50-50 and I think TikTok is 60, yeah. I don't know, not sure about uh, TikTok, but Twitch is definitely 50-50. We, we briefly talked about um, the Warner Media and them making new films. Like, I was asked if what if I would like to see something like that. I said The War of Angmar is something I would like to see. Kinstrife might be interesting, but maybe a bit too complicated. I think, yeah, it might be interesting. I hope something good comes of that, but we will, we have to see. The chat GPT was so apologetic too. It has to apologize after every answer to the stuff wrong. And it's, yeah, it's kind of, that was kind of cute. I don't know how uh, you would uh, set up uh, here and on Twitch though. Not going to hold my breath, yeah. I don't know. We, we will see. Something good. I, you can only make something good or bad if you make it. So they have to make something and maybe it will be good or bad. We will find out in a moment. Or not a moment, but in a year, two, three. I don't know how long it will take. I'm warning, if nobody will ask an AI question, I will. Yeah, let's, come on, chat. Is there any question we could ask the AI that is not too difficult to answer? Like, it needs to be somewhat answerable. Like, maybe Gollum's age is a good question. Because it seems currently I can log into ChatGPT stuff. So that is kind of cool. Maybe I should set it up in the background already. So we have seen it um, in the, if you haven't seen that, I make this basically a AI that you can ask stuff and it understands it. And yeah, we have to phrase very carefully what we want to know there. Sometimes you can't log in though because it's too busy, the servers, but whatever. Could Gollum have survived the fall, uh, the lava fall since he had his uh, precious? How, yeah, how old is Gollum Smear? So we have now to decide. Shall we ask the bot a what if question? Or an, I guess maybe for another video, a what if stuff. Could Gollum have survived the lava fall since he had his precious? I would say the answer is, I would say no, but what happened to the evil men of the East after the Third Aid? Okay, that is a very difficult question to answer, I think. People have short attention spans. <laughs> Maybe. What's the story, short version, of Arwen's necklace? Oh boy, now, now come a lot of questions. Am I seeing this right? These are all questions for the AI.
Or do you actually want um, me to answer the question really quick? May write a uh, question for AI or something like that. Oh, the evil men of the East. That's a really tough question, I think, after the Third Age. I wouldn't even know what I would answer to that. So, very good question, um, Eye Shield. You know what? Maybe we, we just see. Um, maybe we could ask multiple questions. Why not? We still have like 10 minutes or so. Okay, let, let's just um, simply um, ask a bunch of questions. Because I can't decide on the questions anyway. So, Let's tell the bot that we want to talk about Tolkien's uh, books. Okay, I have a really weird flickering bug. I'm not sure what causes it. Uh, certainly, I'll do my best to help you with... Um, I can make it a bit bigger so you can read it easier. Certainly, I do my best to help you with any questions you have about Tolkien's books and writings related to Lord of the Rings. Please go ahead and ask your questions. Can you... Let's also maybe ask him if we can give um, references. Can you also give me references? And sources um, for your answers? Question mark. Of course, I try my best to provide reference and sources for my answers whenever possible. Also, I was, uh, I was, um, I was hinted at um, that I should also um, tell the bot that um, uh, please let me also know if you don't know an answer. Okay, okay, we got this. So, um, how old is Gollum? Question mark. Uh, Gollum's age is not precisely known, but he is estimated to be around 600 years old at the time of his death in The Lord of the Rings. The character's age is mentioned in the book The Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring, in which Gandalf says that Gollum has been fishing and wandering in the mountains ever since he lost um, the One Ring, ages and ages ago. Tolkien's notes on Gollum's backstory indicate that he was originally a member of the river folk of the Anduin and that he found the ring about 500 years before the events of The Hobbit. So by the time of the death of Lord of the Rings, Gollum is likely around 600 years old. That is a pretty accurate answer, I would say. Could Gollum be saved? Okay, that's a that's a really tough one. <laughs> we want to stream because we don't want the answer to end. Hmm. 
Not too many answers. <laughs> Where was Gondor when the Westfall fell? <laughs> that is probably the most random question I have. Um, that's good. So if we go to Tolkien Gateway um, to answer the question, it says Tolk uh, Gollum is 589 years old when he dies. So let me just check up the source really quick on that. Because we need the birth date. Nah, I probably don't have it here. But in the Complete Guide of Middle-Earth by Robert Foster, it seems there's an indication when Gollum is born. I think it's nowhere else, but the estimation is pretty correct too, what, uh, what the bot is saying here. Necklace. Ah, okay. Now I get the joke as well. Um, okay, I, I like the question of um, Eye Shield. <laughs> Where was Gondor when the Westfold fell? <laughs> That's, in my opinion, my favorite question. As in, letter to many. Where was Gondor when the Westfold fell? <laughs> The West Fort was a region in Rohan, not Gondor. It was located to the east of the Mind Mountains and was one of the main regions of Rohan. The West Fort is known for its hills and for uh, being the site of the Battle of the Hornburg during the War of the Ring. During the events of Lord of the Rings, Gondor was also under attack from Sauron's forces, particularly from the armies of Mordor. However, the West Fort was not directly related to Gondor's military situation. The Rohirrim of the Westfold came to the aid of Gondor during the Battle of the uh, Pelennor Fields, which was a key battle in the War of the Ring, but the Westfold itself was not part of Gondor. So, that's maybe a good, <laughs> very <laughs> good answer to that. It was simply not part of Gondor. And they were busy other, other way. What is in my pocket? Might be an interesting... Th I'll accept it. <laughs> what is in my pocket? This is a riddle that Bilbo Baggins poses to Gollum in John Ronald a rule of Tolkien's book, The Hobbit. Bilbo finds a magic ring that makes him invisible and he uses it to escape Gollum's lair. However, before leaving, he challenges Gollum to a riddle game and the wager is Bilbo's life. During the game, Bilbo poses a riddle, what have I in my pocket, and Gollum is unable to answer it, as he had not seen the ring and did not know that Bilbo had it in his pocket. Bilbo thus wins the game and is able to escape from Gollum's lair, lair with his life. It con it definitely um got this. The chat answered. Maybe let's let's maybe ask um a little follow up question to this. <laughs> what status, precious? What was the price if or what would Bilbo get if Bilbo get in the Hobbit book if he uh, wins the riddle game against Gollum. It's a very interesting question. We have a follow-up question to that. Just very curious if you bot knows. 
Now in the book, so and so forth, Gollum engaged in a riddle game and the wager is Bilbo's life. If Bilbo wins the game, Gollum must show him the way out of, uh, of the goblin tunnel and allow him to leave unharmed. However, if Gollum wins, he gets to eat Bilbo. Bilbo manages to win the game by asking Gollum the riddle. What have I got in my pocket? Gollum, who was not aware of Bilbo, had found the magic ring that made him invisible, was unable to answer the riddle and thus lost the game. As a result, Gollum reluctantly agrees to show Bilbo the way out of the tunnels and Bilbo is able to escape within. Oh. Okay, follow up. I always find it fascinating how deep the book, uh, the, the what might be. Yet in the Hobbit book, in the first edition, Okay, he knows about that as well. In the first edition of the Hobbit book, the terms of the riddle game between Bilbo, Baggins and Gollum were slightly different than in later editions. In the original version of the story, the stakes of the game were not explicitly stated and the winner of the game was simply allowed to go free. That is not correct. However, in later editions of the book, including the revised published edition in 1951, Tolkien changed the stakes of the game to Bilbo's life. So, in the original first edition of The Hobbit, Bilbo does not explicitly win anything other than his freedom, while in the later editions the stakes of them um, are wrong. So here we have a little um, trick question. Also, I'm not sure how her name is pronounced. Tachi Bankoyoku? Yoko, something like this. Or oh, it's, um, no. Tachi Banakyoku. Your, I, it's really hard to say for me, to be honest. But yeah, thank you uh, for your um, membership. Much, much appreciated. <laughs> Fool of a Turk, I like that. Um, yeah, but um, in the first edition of The Hobbit, the book, the terms of the riddle between are slightly different. In the original version of the story, the stakes of the game were not explicitly stated. No, that is not, that is wrong. The original prize was the one ring, was the magical ring. Wasn't the prize in the first edition of The Hobbit? Oh can't type as you can see in the first edition of a hobbit um the magical ring question mark the one ring didn't exist in the first edition you are correct i apologize for the mistake in my previous answer in the first edition of the hobbit the stakes of the riddle game between bilbo and baggins were different from later editions. the original version the story Bilbo won the game gollum was to show him the way out of the cave and give him a present to his own choice no. <laughs> if, Gollum won, if Gollum won, he could um, get to eat Bilbo. In the original version, Bilbo finds the ring after he defeats Gollum the Ring again, and it's not until the sequel of Ring that the ring's true nature and power and corrupting of is revealed in the latest of Hobbit, including the rise of the Yeah, it, it is not right. The, the bot is confused again. So here we have a clear mistake, unfortunately. And sometimes very it needs a lot of patience to tell the bot that he's very wrong. But he insists often on things. He's very stubborn. He could be a dwarf. Oh, that's a good question by um, the amazing bad boy. Do Balrogs have wings? I take that one. The description of Balrogs in John Wild Rule Tolkien's work works is not entirely consistent and there is some debate among fans and scholars about whether Balrogs have wings. In The Lord of Rings, the Balrog encountered by Gandalf in Moria is described as having wings and the film adaption of the book also portrays the Balrog with wings. However, in other writings by Tolkien, such as The Book of Lost Tales and The Silmarillion, Balrogs are not described having wings, but rather as being powerful demons with fiery whips and flaming swords. It's possible that the description of Balrogs with wings in Lord Rings was added by Tolkien later on in this writing, or it could simply be a matter 
of interpretation. Some fans and scholars argue that Baldrog's wings, not rings, could be metaphorical or symbolic, representing a creature's ability to move swiftly and effortlessly through the air. Ultimately, the exact appearance of Baldrog's is left somewhat ambiguous in Tolkien's works, and there is no definitive answer to they have. Can you quote the passage? Um, can yeah, you quote the passage of Balrogs being described with wings in the Lord of the Rings? book. Yes, I can write a quote from Lord of the Rings in which a Balrog is described as having wings. In the books, the Balrogs... <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh man. <laughs> this is passage. <laughs> it's it's kind of funny, I have to admit. Like you you definitely it, it's such a cool technology, but you sometimes definitely notice uh, the limitations of it uh, in in cases like this. Like, I don't know what to say. Maybe I should also read it for people w watching this. Yes, I can provide a quote from The Lord of the Rings in which the Balrog is described as having wings. In the book, the Balrog is encountered by Gandalf and the Fellowship of the Ring in the Mines of Moria. When the Balrog appears, it is described as follows. The fire in the Balrog's eyes was quenched and he was but a great shadow, a dark standing shadow. He swung his sword and clave the mountainside and laid its mighty bones bare to the sun. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh man, his wings spread wide and he stepped forward slowly into the air until he stood uh, clear above Gandalf. This passage from Lord of the Rings, Book 2, Chapter 5, The Bridge of Khazad Doom describes um, the Balrog as having wings that it spreads wide before stepping into the air. It is worth noting that this is only explicitly mention of wings in the books when it comes to Balrogs and other references uh, in Tolkien's works includes detail. Hey, you are live. Yes, I'm live. Um, unknown 247. <laughs> is it polite to toss a dwarf? Yeah. So th this quote, just for people not familiar with the books, let me just um, uh, let me just read the actual quote of um, where it's mentioned. So it's it is right. It's in chapter five, the bridge of Khazad Doom um, in Lord of the Rings. Uh, the Balrog made no answer. The fire in it seemed to die. That's maybe what he has was quenched, I guess. Uh, seemed to die. Oh, wait, I lost the, the line here. Um, the fire in it, uh, in it seemed to die, but the darkness grew. It stepped forward slowly on the bridge, and suddenly it drew itself up a great height, and its wings were spread from wall to wall. But, and so on and so forth. This is one reference where it says clearly that it has wings. Okay, now I'm kind of annoyed by my searching um, thing here. How oh, I lost my thing here. I have to find it again. I 
I have this activated chat. I'm an idiot. I know what I did wrong. I have exact search, not the general search. So that is the problem. Yeah, his enemy halted again, facing him, and the shadow about it reached out. And now comes the very important word, like. Two vast wings. It raised up in height. And then later it says, a few sentences later, we have the other quote I just wrote. It stepped forward slowly on the bridge, and suddenly it drew itself up a great height, and its wings were spread from wall to wall. It seems like the term wings only appears two times in this complete section here. And one time it says, it... Its shadow reached out like two vast wings. So its shadow is reaching out and it looks like wings. And then the wings spread from wall to wall. That's basically um, it. But this quote is completely made up. It's kind of funny. I mean, I answered pretty good to the question, um, where did Arwen's necklace come from? Okay, we ask that next, I would say. Where did Arwen's necklace come from? Arwen's necklace is known as the Evenstar, and it was given to her by her grandmother, the elf queen Galadriel, who is also known as Lady of the Wood. In Lord Ring's book, Arwen wears the Evenstar as a symbol of her love for Aragorn, and it is described as a beautiful and precious jewel that glows with a pure white light. The even star is made from a single white gem, which is said to have been fashioned by Galadriel from the light of the two trees of Valinor, which were destroyed long before the events of the story. No. <laughs> the even star is also a symbol of hope and renewal in the story, and it is said to represent the undying nature of the elves and their connection to the natural world. Arwen gives the even star to Aragorn as a token of love for him, and he wears it as a badge of honor throughout the story. Oh, Chetty Lumpkin is here. Welcome, man. And we have spoken before, and it's definitely possible, but sometimes I simply don't remember all the names, uh, which is unfortunate, but um, very nice that you are back then. Well, it's also Cranky, he um, has also an interesting question. Um, yeah, so the even star is more a thing that exists in the films and not in the books, necessarily. Is that not only in the films? Also, um, in the books, Gan um, Aragorn becomes, be gets the Elisar from Galadriel. But that's a different thing. You are correct, that is in the movies. The origin of Ar Arwen's even star necklace is not explicitly stated. Instead, the necklace serves as a symbol of Arwen's love. Mm -hmm. In the book, the origin of even star is explained in more detail. As described earlier, Arwen's given the even star necklace by grandmother. Isn't that the Elisa question mark? You are correct. I want to associate with the, uh, another jewel known as the Elisar or Elfstone Tolkien Twerk. The Elisar is a green gemstone <laughs> and so forth. Like, uh, you can just go on, on and on with um, trying to correct the bot. In some adaptations, the even star necklace and the Elisar stone have been conflated or confused with each other, and some fans do them in charge. However, in the book, there are two separate jewels. Let us. Let us look for the even star necklace in the book. I may have the book here. I can just search in the book. <laughs> Undomil, for she was the even star of her people. Next, next thing. O lady of Lorien, of whom were sprung um, Kilebrian and Arwen even star. What praise could I say more? Daughter, even star of her people. Now we have actually a mention of the even star. That's interesting, I think. But where this now in the memory of Elfstone and even star with whom your life has been woven? So the Elfstone is the Elisar, and the even star um, is uh, Arwen. 
And I think in the book, the term even stars only used for Arwen exclusively, not ever for a necklace or something like that. And Arwen even star remained also. Um, daughter Eleanor the Fair is one of the maids of Queen Evenstar, that is Arwen. Lady of Imlaris and of Lorien, Evenstar of her people. Uh, although, but as for Arwen the Fair, Lady of Imladris and of Lorien, Evenstar of her people. Uh, for I'm mortal, and if you will cleave to me, Evenstar, uh, Evenstar then Twilight you must also renounce. At last, Lady Evenstar, fairest in the world. Two more, or three more. Um, here ends this tale as it, is, uh, as it has come to us from the south and with the passing of Evenstar, no more is set in this book of the days of old. Evenstar in this case is Arwen. And then next two entries are the Evenstar. In the, in the um, index it says Evenstar see Arwen. There's no mention of a necklace called Even Star in the books. So just to um, not get people on the wrong track. I'm very much enjoying the podcast. Yeah, you can definitely see this here as a live podcast. So glad you uh, enjoy this. A very popular guy. I don't feel that popular, I have to admit. But uh, much appreciated. Your channel has grown significantly. Yeah, that... Over the years, it has grown quite a bit. So I'm very um, grateful for that, of course. Yeah, that's also interesting. Um, uh, Tachi Bang... I, oh, this is, the name is very difficult to say. Tachi Banakyoku. Something like this. As it's uh, funny, it gave different. Yeah, it, I think it can give different answers. Um, if you, I, I could maybe start a new thing, and it would give a diff completely different answer again. But you have to see it like this: the AI predicts what the correct answer to a question could be, and this answer it gives you. Like it's, it's complicated to explain, but it's not. The AI is not going to Google and um, searching the answer, or just reading through the book and just give you the answer. It tries on the data it has to predict what the answer to this question is. And in some cases, it's really good. In some cases, it's really bad. A question for the is also by Cranky. That's an interesting question. Um, but this is a question I potentially can't answer. So maybe I hope you have to help out here, Cranky. So when you read Lord of the Rings, maybe let me just spell this out so it does not come to confusion. So I know, pretty sure it knows Lord of... When, it, uh, when you read Lord of the Rings in German versus English, do you pick up subtle difference... Uh, subtle, uh, pick up subtleties in, te in the text. Gandalf is distantly... Uh, distinctly formal in Portuguese, and Sam seemed much like a servant in Japanese. As an AI language model, I do not have personal experience of reading text in different languages, but I can tell you that it is common for nuances and subtleties to be lost in translation, as the meaning of words and expressions can vary depending on the language and cultural context. In the case of The Lord of the Rings, the original text was written in English by John Ronald Rule Tolkien. So some of the nuances of the language and cultural references may be lost or altered in translations to other languages. For example, the name choices for characters and places in Lord of the Rings are often based uh, on Old English or Norse mythology, and some of these references may not be easily translatable to other la languages. Additionally, the tone and style of the writing can be different to capture in translation, as each language has its own unique uh, literary traditions and conventions. For example, the formal language used by Gandalf in Portuguese translation you mentioned may be an attempt to capture the archaic and elevated language uh, used by characters in the original text, while 
the depiction of Sam as a serf in Japanese translation may reflect cultural attitudes towards class and hierarchy in Japanese society. Overall, while translations uh, can bring great works of literature to new audiences and allow readers to experience stories in the native language, it is important to be aware that nuances and subtleties of the original text may be lost in translation. So that's a pretty cool answer, I have to admit. I hope Cranky is happy with that. Thanks a lot for the explanation. Yeah, no problem. It is so, um, yeah, very um, interesting. There was another question, I think, earlier. Okay, amazing bad boy with the classic questions. Why didn't the great eagles just fly Frodo to the one ring uh, and the One Ring to Mordor. This is a common question among fang fans of the Lord of the Rings. While the eagles play a key role in the story and are instrumental in several battles, they do not simply fly Frodo and the One Ring to Mordor for several reasons. First, the eagles are not servants of the characters and cannot be command uh, commanded to do their bidding. They are intelligent... Oh, I have to scroll up. They are... Let me make it a bit smaller. <laughs> um, they are intelligent beings with their own motivations and desires and they choose when and how to help others based on their own judgment. In the story, the eagles agree to help the characters when they see a clear need and believe it is the right thing to do. Second, the eagles are not invincible and are vulnerable to attack. If they were to fly directly into Mordor, they would likely be spotted and attacked by Sauron's forces, who have many weapons that could harm them. In the story, the eagles only enter Mordor at great risk, and they do not uh, do, so in, uh, do so to aid in the final battle against Sauron. The mission of destroying the ring is not just a matter of transport, even if the eagles were able to fly Frodo to Mordor without being detected, it would not be enough to simply drop him off at Mount Doom. The mission requires stealth, cunning and sacrifice, and Frodo must navigate treacherous terrain, uh, treacherous terrain, avoid detection by Sauron's forces and resist the corrupting influence of the ring. The story In the story, Frodo uh, and his companions must undertake a perilous journey on foot using their own skills and resourcefulness to achieve their goal. In short, while the eagles are powerful allies, they can they cannot simply solve all the characters' problems by flying them to their destination. The story requires the character to face challenges, make sacrifices, and rely on their own abilities in order to succeed in their quest. So yeah, that's also, I guess, a pretty decent question. Is pipeweed illegal? Potentially. Also, Noah asked this question, so I answer where two of one. <laughs> Why does one not simply walk into Mordor? <laughs> okay, I like that. <laughs> The line, uh, one does not simply walk into Mordor, is a famous quote from the character Boromir in the movie adaption of The Lord of Rings. That's pretty nice that it figured that out. In the story, this line is spoken during the council of the characters who are trying to decide the best way to destroy the ring, which has been thrown into the fires of Mount... Uh, yeah, has to be thrown in the fires of Mount Doom in Mordor to be destroyed. The reason that one cannot simply walk into Mordor is that it's a perilous and heavily guarded region controlled by the evil forces of Sauron. Mordor is surrounded by a range of high, impassable mountains and is patrolled by Sauron's, uh, Sauron's armies, including orc, trolls and other creatures. Additionally, Mordor is a desolate and harsh environment with little food, water or shelter, making it very difficult to survive there for any length of time. Furthermore, anyone who attempts to enter Mordor risks being detected by Sauron's forces who have powerful and dangerous weapons at their disposal. Therefore, the characters must find a way to enter Mordor undetected and travel through it to Mount Doom without being uh, captured or killed. This requires careful planning, stealth and bravery as well as a willingness to make sacrifices and take risks in order to achieve their goal.
<laughs> it was totally cool for the eagles to go to uh, to get Gandalf. Um, I think, yeah, as said, the the getting Gandalf was more an accident. Like uh, Radagast sent the eagles to, I don't know, sent news to Gandalf, I think, and he Gan Radagast expected that Gandalf was in Orthanc, and then the eagle found Gandalf sitting on top of it, and then he rescued Gandalf as a result. But it was more like. Gandalf, uh, Radagast accidentally sent the eagle and rescued Gandalf with that. Though Gandalf asked Radagast to send news to him, um, potentially with the eagles and so on. Oh, Cranky's question was not to ChatGPT, it was to me. Oh, that is interesting. Ah, now I get it. Um, so, by my experience, like, I haven't read the German Lord of the Rings um, in quite some time. I feel like um, the, trans the German translator, um, uh, two actually, but the older one, um, which version I, translation I also like more, by Margaret um, Caru. Um, she translated very well, in my opinion, and um, did a really good job there. So there are some subtle differences here and there as well, as you potentially um, know it out. But since German and English are relatively close related languages, um, in many ways, interestingly, though in some ways not, but not, like they are definitely related, but some things are just very different in German compared to to English, but that's, um, I, I feel like often it is definitely possible to translate stuff. Sometimes though it gets complicated. I feel like it captured um, what Tolkien wrote quite well most of the time. The German version also feels a cake at times, how um, Ka um, Karu um, translates some stuff. But um, Tolkien, like the English one as well, though for me as a not native English speaker, I don't have a feeling for how ancient it would feel for a native speaker compared to how I, how archaic something feels for me as a German native speaker when I read the translation, if that makes sense. So, um, yeah, sorry for getting a bit confused there. It's also an interesting question. But it might be um, difficult to answer for the bot because I think there's no real answer. Like, it's Tom Bombadil, he can just appear and make haste, if that makes sense. How many on, uh, con um, occurrences of the word ring in the whole Lord of the Rings? Well, that's, a good, that's an interesting question. We could maybe try. How many. Let me just, uh, oh, new occurrences. Let me write it like this. I'm sorry, but as an AI model, I do not have access to the full text search of Lord of the Rings book. However, it is estimated that the word ring appears more than 1,000 times throughout the entire trilogy. Given the central role of the ring's place in the story, however, this is only an estimate and the actual count may vary depending on factors. Oh, that's pretty cool. It says, I don't know, basically. Um... Two thousand two hundred twenty nine times it appears with with index though, where it also appears quite a lot. Wait. I have to correct this because that's not correct. That's not correct. Let me just six hundred seven times the word ring appears and the plural rings appears one hundred fifty four. So seven hundred fifty four what did I say with rings? Six hundred eleven plus 154, 765 times, in case you want the real answer.
I saw a new th theory. That's interesting. Um, new for me anyway. Also new for me, I have to admit, that Tom Bombadil is actually the Witch King. I totally uh, don't buy it, but to the eye, is Tom Bombadil actually the Witch King? Okay, that is a... I like the question, Paul. I know you're a long-time supporter, so I... It's a no-brainer to ask that. <laughs> I would answer the same... Like, the first se the first few words are like, no, <laughs> Tom Bombadil is not the Witch King. There's no evidence in Tolkien's writings to suggest that Tom Bombadil is the Witch King of Angmar or any other character in disguise. Tom Bombadil is a mysterious, enigmatic character who appears in the Fellowship of the Ring. He's, uh, he's described as a strange, powerful being who lives in the Old Forest and possesses a kind of magic that is different from other characters in Middle-earth. However, his origin and true nature are never fully explained in the books and he remains a subject of much debate and speculation among Tolkien fans. The Witch King, on the other hand, is a powerful and malevolent figure who serves as a chief of the Nazgul, uh, who serves as the chief of the Nazgul, Sauron's most feared servant. He is a major antagonist in the story and is known for his role in the attack of Minas Tirith and the Battle of the Pelennor Fields. He is depicted as a terrifying figure who is almost invincible in battle and there is no connection between him and Tom Bombadil in Tolkien's writings. Can't you see the AI is Anatar? Yeah, that is um, also a theory I already have. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it might be a copyright issue that they may, might never feed the actual books, but it would be interesting to know what the AI could do if it had access to all the text Tolkien wrote. That would be really fascinating. But maybe we ask also the question of Chetty Lumpkin, because why not? It's kind of interesting what the bot has to say. The arrival of Tom Bombadil to save the hobbits from the Barrowites in Lord of the Rings is not fully explained in the books. That Tom Bombadil is a mysterious character who possesses great power, blah blah blah. It suggested that Tom Bombadil um, has some kind of connection to the natural world, and he may have been able to sense that the hobbits were in danger and come to their aid. He is also depicted as being very knowledgeable about the history of law of Middle-earth, so he may have been aware of the Barrow Whites and the danger they, uh, they posed to the travelers in the area. In the book, it's not clearly how Tom Bombadil arrived so quickly, and his appearance remains a mystery. That is true. However, his timely arrival saves the hobbits from certain doom, and he helps them to escape from the Barrow Downs and continue their journey. Endwise. I just saw my passing reference on the internet and uh, wondered if it's floating around in net space might influence the AI. Yeah, interesting. I'm not sure who came up with the Tom Bumble Witch King theory. Uh, also, not no idea. I know that the Witch King went to the Barrow Downs before and roused basically the the, the Barrow Whites there, but it is written in unfinished tales in The Hunt for the Ring, I think, but um, I don't know. And that's an interesting question, actually, um, by Norwell. What happened to the Endwise? In The Lord of the Rings, it is implied that Endwise, a race of female ends, were lost or destroyed during the War of the Last Alliance, which took place more than 3,000 years before the events of the book. That's true. The Entwives were known for their love of gardens and ag agriculture, and they lived in different areas in Middle-earth than the male Ents, who were more focused on the protection of the natural world. It's also true, I guess. The Entwives and Ents used to live together in an area that is now the Brown Lands. That's true, east of the Misty Mountains. However, during the war, the lands were laid waste, and the Entwives disappeared. The male ants searched for them for many years, but they were unable to find them, and it suggested that they have been destroyed or enslaved by the forces of Sauron. It's also correct. In the Two Towers, Tribet laments the loss of the Endwife and sings a song about his memories of them. He suggests that they may still be alive somewhere in Middle-earth, and that they may someday be found, but this remains uncertain. The fate of the Endwives is one of the great mysteries of Tolkien's Legendarium, and their story remains subject of much speculation and debate among fans of the books. So that um, 
the endwives were potentially destroyed or enslaved is mentioned by Tolkien um, or theorized by Tolkien in a letter. That's one of his letters. Kind of interesting to see. Okay, I, I shield also ask a question, maybe last question. Uh, did uh, Gimli or Legolas kill more orcs? Maybe we should form it. Maybe say slay more orcs. In the Lord of the Rings, both Gimli and Legolas are skilled warriors who slay many orcs over the course of the story. It's difficult to say for certain who slays more orcs and the battles. <laughs> Um, and kills were not always counted or quantified in a straightforward way. However, there are a few notable moments in the story where Gimli and Legolas' uh, feats of combat are highlighted. For example, during the Battle of Helm's Deep, Gimli and Legolas engage in a friendly competition to see who, slay, uh, who can slay more orcs, with Legolas ultimately coming out on top by a narrow margin. During uh, Battle of Pelinophils, Gimli and Legolas also fight valiantly alongside each other, slaying many orcs and other enemies of the free people. Overall, both Gimli and Legolas are fierce warriors who contribute greatly to the fight against Sauron's forces. While it may uh, be difficult to determine who slays more orcs, their bravery and skill in battle are evident throughout the story. So, that's the answer to that. Isn't, like, isn't even in the book I have, haven't they, like, isn't, doesn't Gimli win at the end? Or something like this? Or is it uh, a draw? Isn't it a draw? I, I don't remember the exact, like, I'm very terrible with memorizing numbers. Does somebody know in chat? No, it says, wait, is there more? Twenty one said Gimli, good said Legolas, but my count is now two dozen. It um has been knife work up here. But I don't know, um... Well, the bot might be right. Fortunately, nobody in chat seems to know the exact quote as well, so it's always unfortunate. What a fascinating demonstration, I had no idea. It's kind of, it's really interesting um, to ask about stuff, but sometimes it's not right, unfortunately. <laughs> That's probably a too deep question. I also need to end the streams um, 
slowly. Wait, I think I found the quote. Oh, it's in the road to Eason Yard. Um, he had no helmet about his head. Uh -huh. 42, Master um, Legolas, he cried. Alas, my axe is notched. Uh, the 42nd um, had an iron collar in his neck. Uh, how is it... Uh, how is it with you? You have passed my score by one, answered Legolas, but I do not uh, grudge you um, the game. So glad am I to see uh, you on your legs. So that is in the uh, in the chapter after it, I think. I didn't search further, so that was my mistake here. Yeah, it's in the road to uh, Eason Yard. Where um, it comes to this. it, it's possible that Legolas let let's just um, let Gimli win, but the board is not correct here. Um, in the books, Legolas does not win; Gimli wins by by one. At least le maybe Legolas lets him win. It's not clear. Uh, no, sorry, and uh, ChatGPT is fun. I use it sometimes, but when uh, we could go uh, farther by just organizing ourselves, making our own choking questions, and thinking uh, by ourselves, that is true. It's sometimes funny to ask questions and then see how correct the bot is. That's currently kind of a funny um, concept. Are Gandalf and Tom Bombadil the same person split apart from uh, uh, Vaina Moinen? That is an um, interesting question. Okay, that's the last question we ask for today. We just copy paste it like you spelled it. No, Gandalf and Tom Bombadil are not the same person, nor are they split apart from uh, Vaina Moinen. Gandalf is a wizard in Tolkien's Legendarium, while Tom Bombadil is a mysterious and enigmatic character who is older and more powerful than he appears. Uh, Vaina Moinen, on the other hand, is a mythological figure from Finnish folklore. Ah, okay. Uh, who is often associated with wisdom, music, and magic. While there are some similarities between um, Vaina Moinen, I'm not sure how it's pronounced. I assume the, these are tremors, so this means it is. Um, is this a diff song, or is this an like? Is are these? Can you maybe uh, pumpkin uh, Rick? Can you tell me if these are um, um, diaresis, so different syllables, or is this just? Uh, Vena Moinen, uh, or something like this. I'm not sure. But it's kind of interesting to see. And on the other hand, is a mythological figure from Finnish folklore who is often associated with wisdom, music, and magic. While there are some similarities between um, Mr. V Point and Tom Bombadil, such as their association with music and nature, they are distinct figures from different culture tr cultural traditions. While talking was heavily influenced by myths and legends from a variety of cultures, he did not intend for his characters to be direct adaptions or reimaginings of existing mythological figures. Uh, rather, he drew upon these traditions to create unique original mythology of his own, with its own distinct characters and stories. Close enough, yeah, probably not. Finnish is, I think, uh, quite a difficult language. So, I'm sorry, I apologize, uh, Pumpkin Rick, for messing up that name. First, I thought it would be a tremor. I read like seeing um, two dots above a vowel, like in Tolkien's writings. And usually, it is not an a like like usually in in an umlaut, but in um, a diaresis. So it means that a and e would be vai instead of vai or ve veina veinem moinen. Very difficult.
I know that the Finnish language also has this beautiful melody, you know, but I can't, um, I, I can't replicate that. It's just very difficult. But okay, people, um, enough chat GPT. Chat is um, already far too uh, long here. I have to admit, uh, or this chat, this stream, I mean, and my brain starts to um, get, get a few legs. And uh, we can end the poll here with 22. So 64% um, um, of people said they actually liked the chat GPT video. Um, 14 said no, and 23 don't mind it or don't care about it. So that's an interesting thing. So it seems like the majority at least um, kind of found it um, very um, enjoyable. So that is interesting. I don't want to make too many of those videos, but I thought it would be kind of funny to um, see what you can do with that and just ask some questions, get some funny answers here and there. And sometimes it's very difficult to correct them as well. And yeah, this was, by the way, the other thing here was my other conversation I had with a bot for the video. There's still some questions unasked. Maybe I, I have enough material for a second part. And yeah, it's kind of interesting. I'll make it maybe at some point. Next, priorities potentially the next who's Elrond part though. And I just really want to um, A good novelty will get old faster. Yeah, I think the same. Like, it's not like I want to do a video or stuff like this every week. It's maybe I make one or two more videos on this, and then we maybe, if I, if if we uh, we come to that back very occasionally only, I guess. It's not like I want to do like a series and release a video every week. My favorite part was correcting it. Yeah, that's sometimes very tricky to be honest because. You know, need to know the answer to the question very well to correct it because sometimes I'm not like I forgot. Like I remembered it also that uh, Gimli actually won the competition, but I couldn't find the the uh, quote far or like the section fast enough. And I said it's in two towers. Two towers I rarely read for what strange reasons, so my two tower knowledge is sometimes a bit lacking. But uh, yeah. It, it's still, though, um, kind of funny and interesting to, to see. And I mean, for, for life, it's maybe a better format. I ask a question, the bot tells the answer, and the chat has to correct it. So people in chat have to think what the actual answer is. So make it the other way around. You know what I mean? That, that would be maybe interesting. That helps me that I don't have to think that much, or I can prepare the questions, and I know the answers to them already. I mean, we can see in chat who wins or something like that. I don't know. Uh, thanks a lot for your um, time. It was has been very educational. Yeah, much appreciate. Thank you for your uh, membership and your support. Also, of all the other people here in chat, as said, if you enjoyed the video, feel free to press the like button um, and um, do subscribing things and so on, you know, if you aren't subscribed yet. As said, I uh, work... Currently, I'm working on a first impressions video for Kerbal Space Program 2 as a video game. Uh, I might finish it tomorrow if I'm lucky enough. Then I focus on Who is Elrond part 10, I think it is. I hope to, like, I can't, I don't know how many parts I still need to complete Who is Elrond. Maybe two, I think, I hope. And then after that, we might come back to the um, film book differences series, like one video, and then see maybe some other topics in between when they come up or I feel like them. So no promise um, there. It could take some time, but I definitely plan on coming back to film and book differences in case, like, I know people have asked a lot when the series is finally coming back. And uh, yeah, so that is planned. Yeah, uh, thank you as always, Chris. Um, take it easy and hope you can make uh, the next live cast. Yeah, I hope so as well. I I'm sorry I missed the chat GPT part. Work called me anyway. Oh no, Tsuchan, but um, you can uh, watch the VOD in a moment if you want and have the time. 
Excellent time as always. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, much, much appreciated. Always uh, have a good time here as well. So I have to admit, I uh, de I'm desperately need to shut up for a moment after talking for four hours. I can tell you that. So what I need to do though now, as always, you know what's coming now. We need to, um, I need to do the credits. <laughs> and of course I haven't prepared them. Some new people have also subscribed. I'm not sure if somebody is subscribed on Twitch as well. At least somebody followed like an hour ago. So much appreciated. Or oh, that is at least. Um, let me think for a moment, chat. How do we do this? Probably it's smart to open my least my, my newest video and copy the credits from there. That I think is the is the um, game plan I have. Game plan? Yeah, whatever, you know what I mean. Open. So yeah, I don't know. Um what else is coming up? Um I'm not sure when the next stream will be. As I said, I try to stream a bit more frequently simply because I really enjoy um, streaming and have a bit of interaction uh, with with people here. Feel free to post maybe in the comments if you have a specific topic for next time that you would like to see discussed or so or have a question. Feel free to post those. I also think about returning to the format where people can write questions into... Um, into the uh, into the comments or whatever, and uh, I maybe may I select one and make a video or so. We could even make a poll and select like I select three questions. You can vote which would be the next question to be answered in an actual law video or so, and that could be a uh, fun as well. I think, um, but yeah, that is basically uh, what I currently plan. Have I forgotten something, Chad? Yeah, on Twitch currently we play. Um, Elden Ring, we just, re yesterday I played a bit of Elden Ring and Satisfactory, which is a very fun, fun game, I have to admit. Kerbal Space Program 2, who is wondering if that's any good. It's just currently not worse, it just play the first game for the time being and wait till it's updated a bit more and it has terrible performance and yeah, that's always a bit unfortunate to, um, to say the least. That's very funny what I did here. Also, my monitor is not clear. I can't see what I'm doing. Okay. So we're slowly getting close to me finishing the credits. Maybe... No, I won't do that like that. I have to render them first. Let us see. Always some people are missing here. Like Paul, I have to still add. It's a bit unfortunate my approach to crediting people um, that I have always, uh, like I said, in this, this the, the stream credits are different than the um, law video credit credits. That always makes it um, a bit complicated for me. And I always feel, uh, feel like I forgot somebody. And of course, I don't want that to uh, happen. Because that would be uh, very impolite if people just subscribe here to the channel and get not properly credited. 
But the good thing is if I do this live, I can also add the people who just subscribed today. So there's that. Paul, I have, I think I got everyone. So now all that's left to do is rendering it and then, sorry, I stepped away for a second. Yeah, Paul, you are there. I just added you to the credits. So in case you will wonder what's uh, going on. And uh, I hope I have everybody and did not forget any anybody here in the credits. Maybe the ending is a bit messed up, but I don't want to keep you waiting here anyway. Uh, Namari, everyone. Yeah, um, see you later, um, Noah. It must be a pretty uh, solitary job being a YouTuber other than the live streams. Sometimes, I guess. But I guess um, people who do YouTube are all, always, in a way, a, a special breed of people, let's put it that way. What is the date for today? Let's say 28th. And I have to click export. We have there. This should be the right thing to do. Thank you, Chris. Take care. Yeah, I will. So Chris has been um, a wonderful time as always. I think um, I can speak for everyone by saying that uh, we deeply appreciate you bringing all of us together and celebrate the professor's creation. Yeah, I agree on that. It's a huge, huge fun to share this. And often I also learn things or refresh things I didn't know because I have to read them up again. The problem is always um, that it's so much that um, Tolkien wrote that it's so easy to, f to start to forget things again because you just, it's just so much stuff that you have to keep in mind. That makes things um, difficult. But I would argue credits, I only have to find stream credits. Oh, there are the credits. 28, 2020, uh, February 2023, that should be it. Okay, we have the credits, chat. Finally, I hope I didn't forget anybody. And cue the credits. Yeah, yeah, I, I did. I'm kind of surprised that I can stream with you people and say to my computer, render these credits in the background without dropping any frames. That's always impressive to me. But I have a very pretty powerful computer, I have to admit. So also shout outs to all the um, artists, of course, like Ted Naismith, Sara Borello, Jenny Dolphin, Kimberly 80 that we used uh, today in the stream. Always um, fantastic to have uh, access to the artists. And of course, shout outs to all the members and Twitch subscribers and whatnot. And also all others who watch my videos and share them, press the like button, write comments and stuff. Much, much appreciated. Thank you all for that. And um, yeah, you can, I do a lot of stuff recently. Currently, I stream a lot on Twitch because, um, yeah, here the logo is a little bit messy. It's not where it should be because I added too many names to this. But yeah, it's a small detail. But yeah, it has been a fantastic stream today. It was very funny. And um, yeah, yes, it's so much. Um, it is difficult that one of many reasons why we appreciate your work and why we appreciate coming together to talk. I really uh, helps in our own research and listen to others. Yeah, fully agree, no, sorry. And so um, thank you also um, all again for the support. I wish you a fantastic rest of the day or evening or a nice um, rest at night. Sleep well, people. Um, and I would say next stream is maybe in a week or two or something like that. If something big announcement happens there might be we see us early on a live stream than you um, might think but uh, if not then maybe in let's say 10 days or something or two weeks let's let's see next month in march i i would say would be the ne next stream so um yeah see you people next time